And we're back with the Culture with Karma podcast, the podcast where we talk about the culture from the perspective of a young, modern, non-theistic Satanist. You guys know the deal. You know how we get down around here. Today I'm talking to my old-time friend, freshman friend, Nick Diaz. He is an Army vet. He is a psych major. And he's someone who I haven't spoken to in years. Yeah. So the first time talking, we're going to sit down and talk right now, discover a little bit more about each other, discover a little bit more about psychology, um, religion from different perspectives, his perspective as an army veteran in modern day, and more. So I hope you guys are excited. Stay tuned. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Comment your opinions. And let's get right into it. So when I say friend, it's kind of um, like saying it lightly because we don't know much about each other. We, like I said, I only knew you freshman year. We talked a little bit, mm -hmm. um, as much as freshmen would, whatever freshmen talk about, not very deep. Who bullshit. are you? Yeah, bullshit, bullshit, not who are you? What are, you know, what's on your mind type of thing, just whatever's going on around us. So mm -hmm. I want to start, first of all, to give people an idea of who you are, um, your childhood, where you grew up at, were you always in Cali? Um, San Bernardino is where I grew up, for those that don't know. But were you always in San Bernardino with me, or where were you at beforehand? So before I moved to San Bernardino, I actually grew up in Colton. So I was started, my parents, they were together for a brief time, went separate ways, and I lived with my mom in Colton. Pretty much grew up there, went to school there and grew up at my grandma's house whenever my mom would work and so I was just kind of around that area you know so and you were kind of between your your mom and your grandma living yeah. with them too oh. yeah pretty much I, I i still had a good relationship with my dad but he just moved somewhere else and so i just picked my mom like different state type of thing and it was uh yeah for a little bit uh it was colorado where my dad lived at and then <laughs> texas where they're currently at yeah. Um, so how would you say you were as a kid? Were you more outgoing or were you a little bit more um, reserved, quiet, introvert or extrovert? In other words, did you have a lot of friends? Did your situation at home impact the way that you, you know, made friends? So I was I was a pretty creative kid. Like I grew up playing with like Bionicles, Legos and fucking action figures and shit. And I always had friends, I always made friends with anybody that was like a kid that lived around me, you know? And so, I would always go outside, hey, cheers. Cheers, Ethan. Cheers. cheers, bro. Thanks for cheers. coming by. Yeah, so I'd go outside and play with kids, you know, just like tag or whatever, creative game, you know, it's like pretty much like kid LARPing. When you say kids, you didn't have any like specific homies that you could think of that were like close homies as a adolescent, you know, like before eighth grade. Um, homies that you connected with, somebody that you would kick it with more often than anyone else? So when I was really, really young, about like preschool, kindergarten, I didn't really have anybody that stuck out like that. And then I'd always like try to make friends with a lot of kids. And anybody who lived close to me, you know, like for a period of time, they weren't really living there very long. So didn't really stick around a long term, not till... I pretty much lived in my grandma's house. I was friends with my neighbors, you know, for a while, you know, I'd always just ha hang out with them yeah. and just be a kid, you know, football yeah. on the street, basketball, that's, all that shit. I feel like that's a reoccurring theme because I, I did a podcast episode with my friend Jay um, not too long ago, and he was moving around a lot as well, so he didn't really have a chance to form friendships with like specific people and be like these were my homies from like yeah. kindergarten all the way to high school type of thing yeah he was moving around a lot uh, mm -hmm. not everybody had that opportunity for me personally i had um friends like you said within the neighborhood that i would hang out with mainly it wasn't at school where i really made friends it was like at home um like my neighbors mm -hmm. who i would like play basketball with walk to the park with something like that you know yeah, what i mean um but besides that, what would you say your elementary life was like, elementary school? Um, do you have a lot of memories of elementary learning anything? Like, do you feel like you learned anything in elementary that stuck with you today? Because for me, I feel like it's not so much the books, um, or not the 
books, but like the, what's the word for it? The the classes, um, the curriculum. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, the curriculum. Like what, what they're trying to teach kids. Yeah, what they're trying time. to teach us. But it's more like what you learn from like interacting and talking to your classmates and friends. That's mm-hmm. what from like, a social with me. perspective. Social yeah. stuff is what stuck with me like till this day. You know what I mean? So do you feel like what stuck with you the most from your um, adolescence mm-hmm. experience? What do you think is the most impactful thing about your adolescence that's currently impacting your character today? So the funny thing is I lived right around, or I didn't live, my grandma lived right around the corner from my elementary school, so it was really close. So pretty much I didn't really want to stick around like school too much after school because I know like a lot of kids are like try to like hang out and like fucking go on the playground and shit. But I, I just went to my grandma's and just hung out and watched TV and fucking eat grandma's food and, you know. You were really at home more than being out and being with the other kids like that? Well, so, school-wise, yeah. School-wise. I, I'd hang out with my friends that were, like, you know, like in the neighborhood, and, you know, but... What sort of hobbies yeah. did you um, find or, like, um, you know, things that you found interesting as a kid? Did you, like, music, games? Um, I know you said bionics, the kind of building and putting things together. So... I ended up moving to Texas, fifth grade. I did fifth grade twice. And so I did the fifth grade in Texas, and then I did the sixth grade, and then I came back. But when I was in Texas, I just went to a whole different area. Like, you know, grew up, went to a brand new school, like, that had just opened. Like, everything was literally brand new. Like, shit had, like, the fucking plastic on it. Yeah. So that was weird. I went from, like, a. Uh, you know the the usual ghetto California elementary school to just state of the art you know brand new elementary school just you know ready for kids to learn like there's even like a fucking media thing where the kids had their own little news channel Dang, and, like, that's crazy. TV, like newspaper like, type of thing or yeah but it was like a channel like they chose some kids to be like anchors and like the teachers would like help them and, like you know like make like daily announcements and shit like said well like what was on the menu for school, which was cool. And so, but I didn't really get along too well with those kids. I, I made friends, but just like the way those kids were, just because they're like, they grew up their whole way of life, just getting spoiled, just getting like anything they want. And they had their fucking quads, like okay, I trampolines. See what you're it was a different environment. They pretty much like their parents like spoiled them. Like, you know, like it didn't matter. Like the, what color of skin was? It's just their parents had a nice job, so they had a nice house, and so they're obviously spoiled. It was a different environment. Yeah, yeah. I get and what so you're saying. Like, Whoa, it's like, I didn't have if, none of this shit. Even if people like what I've noticed is even if the person themselves isn't like an asshole or rude to you, it's just like they will never understand the kind of stuff that we have to go through because they can't understand it you know they never lived through it it's like yeah. even if they try to like feel sorry for you that's not going to make it any better because mm-hmm. it's like i don't want you to feel sorry for me i want you to understand but you can't you like you you never lived through this and you never will type of thing i just need you to respect me and realize that like i've been through more than you've lived through as a as a kid very much you yeah know? and you're looking at your classmates who are kind of like living in a whole nother world than you yeah. are I feel you. We're going to talk about high school a little bit, too, because that's when I met you. I met you um, freshman year uh, at Aquinas, which was a private school. It was a Catholic school, um, it's like, to be even more extreme. What <laughs> year was that, bro? Yeah, like 2012. 2012 yeah, 2011, 2012, 2012, yeah. 2011, man. Shit. It's been a long time, like 10 years now. Yeah. That's probably the last time we've had a real conversation was like 10 years ago. But we went to private school together, so... This was a really extreme environment, um, religiously speaking. Um, Not only that, but back to what you were just talking about, kids were way more privileged than we were because my parents grew up, we we grew up well off. I didn't grow up like poor, broke in the projects or around gang members. That was surrounding us because we were in San Bernardino and we were in this, this area that was gang infested. But my neighbors weren't gang members and stuff like that. My parents grew up or did well enough for me to grow up um, poor around rich people, which was Dave Chappelle's quote. And 
yeah, I pretty much was like surrounded by kids who had a bunch of money. Like you said, they could go on boat trips with their families and ski trips. Yeah. And it's like, dude, when I go home, I'm still stuck in San Bernardino. There is no vacation after school. It's school and back to fucking it, San Bernardino. You know what I mean? So, um, city, something else. What was your perspective? That was that was pretty much my experience going to Aquinas. Was yours pretty much the same thing? Like just feeling like you were the odd man out because you weren't in the same situation as the people you were surrounded with? So after I ended up living in Texas, I moved back in sixth grade to live with my mom. And she had just bought the house in San Bernardino that I used to live at. That The time he knew me, that was the house I was living at. And so moved back to San Bernardino with my mom because it's not that I didn't get along with my dad or my stepmom. Like, I still love them very much. Like, they're one of the biggest supporters of my life. I didn't, like, I had a great childhood. I didn't have anything traumatic. I had great siblings. And so I just didn't like where I was living at. You know, there's nothing against my parents. It's just, you know, you had Texas was a whatever. different vision for where you wanted to be. Yeah, at. as a kid, I didn't appreciate Texas how I would now. You know, Texas is fucking awesome. I, I want to move to Texas someday. You know, Bro, same. But, I'm trying to get yeah. the fuck. Texas. Yeah, get the fuck out of Cali, you know? <laughs> but I just moved back in with my mom. Uh, I went to the same elementary school I went to in the beginning for sixth grade. And then I went to middle school in Colton. I went to Colton Middle School. And I had the genuine public school, ghetto, California experience. You know, people, kids getting in fights, fucking staff and faculty being assholes. Pretty much passing kids along, like, oh, whatever. Just I'm like never gonna fucking see you. Like, pushing them through the process, not really teaching them anything. Yeah, just like yeah, man. There was like, a lot of cares, fights, you know, a lot of fights and a lot of violence. And it's um, going back to the parental relationship. It's like, were you able to talk to your parents about any of this, like that you were seeing? Because this is traumatic stuff. This is something that I'm barely processing, like now as an adult, mm -hmm. that I've seen things that you know kids shouldn't really have to live through or see, and especially nowadays. Yeah, man, and. Did you have anyone to talk to about these things, or did you kind of, the way I described to my wife, put them in a box, excuse me, and just, like, dismiss them until later on when you're older and you could dig through that garbage, mm -hmm. you know? So, pretty much, I didn't really, like, I thought talking to your parents was still cool about, like, you know, like, teenager stuff, but, like, I still, like, you know, my mom was obviously there, like, we lived together for a while until she were married, and then... From there, my mom kind of just tried to be the best parent. She was kind of strict, so I kind of had to watch what the fuck I did. But you know, I, I had too much in middle, too much fun in middle school where it was like, nah, you're you're gonna probably have to go to private school. Otherwise, you're just gonna be a fucking fuck up in high school. Cause I wanted to go to high school in Colton, and so I I had a whole idea where like I just fucking walked to my grandma's after school, fucking change get a bite to eat and just fuck off and do hood rash shield with my friends whatever you know just <laughs> it's like the whole kid thing you have this vision for your life where you're like this could work but it's like you don't understand the adult schedule and all the deep stuff that has to move yeah, around you don't know in order shit. yeah you're, you're like, like you don't selfish understand. Kid. yeah you're like i want life to work how i want it to work but in reality it's like there's this whole mechanism of things that needs to move around in order for things to be how you want them to be um, I think that's something that we need to appreciate, and I try to appreciate now as an adult is that my parents did the best that they could, you know, at the end of the day. And Yeah, um, like most yeah, of us, yeah. You know what I mean? We, I, I think we have all grown to appreciate our parents more and the struggles yeah. that they went through because the more responsibility we have, the more we notice the responsibility that they have, yeah. you know. Shout out to the parents out there holding all it down. All the parents holding it down. Gang shit. P.O.P. Take a break every now and then. Have a day off. Yeah, make you know? some time for yourself. Make your parent, make your That's kids fucking important. pay for your your fucking meal out. Hey, but how do you? How important? Speaking of high school and alone time for parents, how important do you think it alone time is for kids, adolescents, and teenagers? Do you think they should have a level of privacy? This is like a question I've seen recently online. Mm -hmm. um, someone who's um, studying psychology and is a psych major. Do you think that? children are um deserved of some type of alone time you know what i mean privacy yeah so generally i think that 
all kids want to be far away from their parents, but not far away enough to where, you know, they still have them to take care of them. So recently, we just went over a study where they're talking about the different types of attachment. There's insecure attachment and then the secure, secure attachment. So secure attachment's like you love your parents, like every time they came in the room when you were a baby, you know, like you knew that they were there. And you felt comfortable and insecure is like you had a pretty distant relationship with your parents like you you pretty much like had no presence with them and generally that can happen with like people who grow up in broken homes or like you know stuff like that and then that could literally affect you until your adult life where you're still attached to them because you're looking for that sort of relationship that isn't there Mm -hmm. so that's the insecure and so I, I'm I felt pretty secure with my mom, but you know, like everyone else would probably admit, like they were a fucking dumbass kid. You know, they felt like they knew what they wanted. They they wanted to do anything they wanted to as a kid, and they they can get away with it. And so I'd usually try to be a little sneaky, you know, like because strict parents will generate sneaky ass fucking kids because. That's if you how it is, if right. you tell me, you no, know, you can't do that, I'm probably gonna be like, shit. How can I do that? Yeah, what can I map that, out in my what head? What you to just said is facts. It. Is like sneaky parents develop sneaky kids because, like, as a kid, kids aren't dumb. I would see my parents um, ever so often. They they're weed smokers, and I'm positive they were weed smokers when I was a kid because we would find their weed stash, <laughs> and it's like they would be coughing like come inside the house coughing or you know be munching and just acting high you know high stuff but they would never just blatantly say like the way you would if you were having a drink like look me and your mom are gonna go have a smoke right now it's break time son i'm gonna go roll this blunt and smoke it like you guys watch out for yourselves you know like the same way you would tell your kids if you would have a drink it's this communication and openness but when they like sneak and it's like they don't say anything they just walk past us in the living room walk outside but yet we have to be openly communicative with them you know what i mean tell Mm -hmm. them everything it's kind of like it builds this weird relationship where it's like i know what you guys are doing and you're lying to us so why am i going to tell you anything that i'm doing when you get older you figure it out more you're like okay i know what you guys are fucking up to it's like let's be adults and just (laughs) put our bullshit on the table talk about everything Mm -hmm. if we have that adult relationship um but going back to the relationship, like, as a kid, how I was asking, did you have anyone to talk about about those deep thoughts or problems and things that you were seeing, or was it just you alone? Mm, I didn't really express any deep feelings at that age yet, because I didn't really understand, like, what it really meant. To be deep? Yeah, to really be deep. I, I didn't, what real I wasn't were. serious about anything. Like, I was still, like, young, like, you know, like, I hadn't really experienced life as as much as I thought I did yet. And so, um, from the bat, straight off the bat, when I moved to my house in San Bernardino, I was chill homies with my neighbor, TJ. So, TJ, if you're watching this, hey, shout out to you, you know, hope you're doing better out there. Shout out to all the heathens yeah. partaking in this blasphemy. Whatever time, day, country you're partaking in this, shout out to you yeah, guys. You whatever guys fucking the... language you're talking in. Yeah, man. Ni hao. <laughs> whatever you're speaking mm-hmm. man it's yeah. just i really appreciate the support i really appreciate everyone watching i appreciate the homie for coming through and having conversations uh i love exploring thoughts and i hope you guys enjoy exploring these thoughts with us but as you were saying your homie tj so he was he was around my age and so he lived with his dad in the back with his aunt and so they had a their house is really, really close to us, like right next to us. One of those houses that wasn't supposed to be that close, but somehow, like, we both kind of just said, eh, whatever. You know, like, we're, we're both cool. We, like, like, I was cool with both my neighbors, but he was my friend, and, you know, I'd go go off to his house and then smoke weed with him. Like, his, his dad didn't care. And so, like, that's how I kind of started all that. I mean, I didn't first that's start smoking with him, but started? I smoked... When I was in middle school, and the the funny thing is, the first time I attempted to smoke, it was behind a fucking church what? in Colton through a pen cap. Homie was and then only one of the home only one of the homies got high, bro. And we're like, "Wow, fuck you, bro!" Like, 
We paid. We 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 all put five dollars for this fucking I mean, I, sack. We used to Fuck do that off. shit in high school, like pen caps and smoking Ugh, out of bottles, so bro. Bad that's bad. You. It's bad. Don't, bro. It's bad. Please, please don't if anybody's it, listening, please don't do that shit. It's terrible for you. It's terrible for your health. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, bro, we used to smoke it. out of that shit. We would get the back of the pencil, the metal part, May- yeah, and you would put the weed in there because you're like, well, the metal's. Yeah, it's not gonna terrible logic. It's not please, like I said, metal. don't do it. It's not good for your health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's how we smoke, but uh, we obviously, like, we fucking rolled up just swishers, and we fucking somehow always find a liquor store that didn't card us, so Bro, like, whatever. shout out they, to the days just fucking... of people that didn't card you, shout out to all those yeah. liquor stores, shout out to all those fucking people that bought young niggas fucking um, blunt wraps outside of the liquor store when we asked you, hey, could you buy us a wrap? Shout out to all those yeah. guys. I'm not supporting guys illegal too. activity. The Culture of Karma podcast does not support illegal activity or drug use. Anyways, as you were saying. Yeah, so <laughs> we, we always get people to either get us blunts or we got it ourselves. And sometimes liquor too, beer, you know. Like, I was friends with some people that were really fucking stupid. That were, like, always trying to do, like, beer runs and steal shit. I didn't really like to steal shit because there was always a risk that it posed. I just, didn't want to get fucking caught it, up in heat. Not so only I that, but it just weighs whatever. on you some type of way taking shit that doesn't belong to you. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's whack. Pay for your shit. Don't fucking steal anything. Like, come on. If you steal, you're a fucking bum. People work hard to own these businesses. People work hard to open these businesses. Don't take. If you're going to steal, steal from the rich. Yeah, steal from the rich or steal something back that was stolen from you. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, so pretty much just went through middle school. You know, I went through middle school in a totally different place from where I live in Colton, but they're still similar. Still, you know, they're obviously connected here. Fucking Inland Empire, they're all kind of generally the same, but, you know, still, like, I'd always just hang out with my grandmas after school, but we'd walk home, fucking catch people fighting. People would bring knives to school, you know, some people in between classes, they'd fight. Some girls would fucking turn out fucking pregnant in eighth grade well that's what i was asking you about so you didn't have anybody to talk to about any of this stuff huh like nah, cause this is this is some of the stuff that i experienced as a kid and i honestly feel like this is traumatic stuff that we never yeah. had a chance to express we're, or talk about we were so accustomed to it and all this fucking buffoonery that was going on in school like we just went on with it we didn't really bother to talk about it because as kids you don't know shit unless like you know, obviously, if you if you're dating somebody, I was single for pretty much have most most way until high school, and then from there I was in a long relationship until you now. But getting off topic, yeah, like if, unless you had a girlfriend or a boyfriend to talk to, like no one at that age really like told anybody about their feelings unless right. like, they're fucking trying to simp on somebody. Like we said, you know? like what else are freshmen and you yeah, know, sophomores dude, talking like, about parties and yeah, what parties, going on smoking this weed, fuck fucking, this teacher, fuck that teacher. Fuck, like, yeah. You're not really fuck talking homework, about homework, I'm not doing it. Yeah, which, you're not talking about anything deep, so do there your really homework. is no communication if you didn't have <laughs> relationships. And it worked that way for me too because I didn't have any um serious relationship until like senior year really. To be honest, that was like my first girlfriend was senior year senior year mm-hmm. down there so I, I understand that's why i asked if there was anyone to talk to because when it came to my parents uh they still say that it's our fault as kids that we didn't talk to them because they're like you could have always talked to us but it's like in reality it's like you guys are so aggressive or you have opinions that are so far gone that it's like me as a kid i don't really feel like i want to come and yeah, talk to you a, i don't feel like you understand thing. yeah it's like an understanding thing it's like i don't feel like you understand as much as you say you understand, um, you're entering with a bit of arrogance, assuming like you know what I've been through, and you're dismissing my experiences because you're like, I've been through what you've been through or worse. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah. I mean? That's the kind of vibe I get from parents. But yeah, going back to high school, did you have any plans for your future? The way they say plan for your future, you know, especially junior and senior year, they um, press on it heavy that you need to start planning for your future. It doesn't really process in a lot of kids' heads. Did it process in your head? Did you kind of map out your future of where you'd be? Uh, Did you plan to join the Army? We'll talk a little bit about that in Mm -hmm. a second. But did you plan to join, or did you have a different plan up until last second? That's that's interesting you bring that up. So I wanted to go to college, and I had actually pretty good grades 
throughout after freshman year because freshman year I was kind of feeling everything out you know I just met everybody you know that from a whole different fucking like I don't know where these fucking kids are from you know like I go to a fucking private school and like I'm straight from public school I'm thinking everything's gonna be gay which (laughs) you know until you you meet like minded fucking people you know like my friend here and so pretty much I just started to make some friends and we all just started to kind of kick it with each other. And so I did fine during school. But then I kind of started to kind of be an idiot at home, you know, kind of piss my parents off. And to the point where, like, they didn't really want me to stay at home and go to school. They would rather me just either find a way to go to school over there or join the military. I'm like, you know what, whatever, I'll, I'll just join the military. Like, you know? And so originally, they I kind of tra- didn't want you running around going yeah, to college. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. Like, wh- especially in their house, doing what I'm doing. And so I'm like, whatever, dude. Like, I hear you. I was, I was fucking immature and dumb. And so the army wasn't really a choice. It was kind of like a alternative to what? What was the alternative if you wouldn't have? So I, I could have tried to like apply to get dorming at a school, you know, but. I didn't really think about that nor was I interested I said you know whatever like some people say the military is cool you know like you can learn different skills and you know the government will pay for you to go to college after so I said okay cool I didn't really think about that after you know we'll talk about that but yeah so I wanted to join the Marines at first and so I had almost joined the Marines yeah I remember you were like asking me shit about the military a few years ago yeah, man. I yeah. was denied, actually. Yeah. I, I went up and I had taken the oath and everything, but... I, yeah, they, they fucking... Yeah. They, they do stupid shit like that, but I wanted to join the Marines. And my head ass wanted to fucking be an infantry officer, which is, like, basically, like, infantry. one of the jobs that weigh the hardest on the fucking Marine Corps, because the officer corps and the infantry is the fucking bread and butter, along with all the other combat forces and saw. But, yeah, I wanted to be an infantry officer, and I'm like fucking 120 pound fucking scrawny ass kid still i'm i'm still a skinny guy but you know i'm obviously like you know yeah man. i'm older Honestly, now i'm but... gonna be honest like i said i didn't know much about you or your character in high school so when i figured out you were joining the the army i'm like bro dick niaz his name's nick diaz we used yeah, to call they, him dick they used niaz. to like to say it in reverse it's yeah, funny bro, we, we were to... like dick niaz we're like really this guy's joining the army and it was kind of like are you serious like the army bro but, yeah they're like, man, I, I, you're going to die, you, a, you know? Yeah, like, but we weren't even sure? in any wars at that time. Like, Afghanistan was kind of dying down. So, a few people in our class were like, down. bro, you're crazy. You're joining the army. You don't want to die. I'm like, whatever, yeah, dude. But like, it was just more knows. surprising because I didn't know much about you. And from knowing about you, it was kind of like we were the stoner kids, the outcasts at Aquinas. So, yeah. I'm kind of like this outcast kid that was like an outcast with me is joining the ranks of the military, which is such a um, disciplined choice you know what i mean it's a it's a long process yeah to go through so um going back to the army uh what was that like for you what was the relationship like with your um brothers in the military what were the barracks like because i know you spend a lot of time on base Mm -hmm. before i I lived on base pretty much the whole time i was in the military and how was life on base yeah so after I graduated high school, I went on vacation to Guatemala with my fam, a Guatemala sick. If you ever have a chance, vacation there. But then right after, got shipped off to fucking to Georgia, for Benning, you know, pretty pretty relative distance from him, Atlanta. But <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we just got on the bus and then you, you obviously do the process where you do maps and you swear in and then piss in a cup and then they fucking check your butthole make you squat and walk that type you know but yeah man. once that's through you're fucking like your life belongs to uncle sam you know like you answer to the man i so, like how you say check your butthole because that's the one thing i remember from maps is that yeah dude, i had to bend all... over in front of the doctor and he had to look inside my anus <laughs> <laughs> the doctor's like fucking 95 years old fucking like when the fuck did you go to med school bro <laughs> fucking the great depression it's like you've been Jesus here since Christ. World War II doing this. Yeah, dude. This, like, huh? he, he checked fucking Audie Murphy's butthole when he went through <laughs> before he got the Medal of Honor. But yeah, so I went through basic, and then uh, so before you would go to basic, like the recruiters were fucking capping 
when they told me that, hey, before you go to basic, you're going to go to reception. They're going to process everything. They're going to yell at you. You're going to be there with a bunch of other privates. But you're only going to be there for like three days, tops. I'm like, okay, all right, yeah, cool. And so I fucked off. I got there. Like, they gave us a fucking sandwich that tasted like shit and like a juice box. And they're yelling at us because we are fucking eating it. <laughs> Like, what the fuck are you supposed to do with this sandwich? But we weren't supposed to eat it yet. And then fucking dudes. They were all, like, 18-year-old dudes. Occasionally, there's like, a few older gentlemen there. But, like, dudes are getting yelled at for standing in front of a fucking doorway. Which, you know, you don't stand in front of a doorway. But in the military, you don't stand in front of a fucking doorway. And so, yeah, we were getting yelled at. And then we eventually, the next day, we got no fucking sleep. We, we pretty much were on... Six hours of sleep throughout the whole three days. We were fucking marching around, getting everything done. So we get our haircut. We we go to sleep, roughly go to sleep, probably wake up 30 minutes later. They're fucking yelling at us. We change into PT shorts, which is just these shorts that have shorts inside of them, so you don't need boxers, and a black shirt with yellow letters that says Army on it. Really? They're like, like swim trunks? Like Basically, yeah. So it's like these shorts that are like up to here, like... And they have a lining yeah, that's black. Like the ones you guys marked. Yeah, in. and there's a little pocket that you could put your ID card, and then there's a spot where you write your name at, and it has another little pocket. So like, you know, you, you guess you put stuff in there, but that was our uniform. We didn't have our fucking like other shit yet until we pulled out of our duffel bag. And so they told us three days. We were there for eleven fucking days. I was. Some people had it way worse. Some people were there for like three months. Some people. Would get hurt. Why did it? And there's nowhere to go. So they'd get sent to the fucking broke dick fat kid camp where kids can't do one pull up. They they measured your fitness before they sent you. Yeah, literally. There's it was full of a bunch of private piles. The first day I was fucking there, some kid had threatened to kill himself. And the drill sergeant, one of the drill sergeants was this fucking pissed off, fucking like short black guy. And he's like, the next morning, any of you motherfuckers. Write that fucking note killing yourself. I have no respect for you. Let me fucking come find you. I'm like, oh shit. What the Thank fuck? You. Dudes are we haven't even gotten here. And on the plane <laughs> on the plane, there's some kid that was talking himself up that was like, Oh, my family, they were Marine Corps drill instructors. Like, <laughs> I'm made for this shit. I already I'm have my shit ready in the moving truck to go to wherever. I'm like, alright, whatever. Said, dude. I'm made for this shit. Yeah, I'm like, whatever, dude. Okay, but this this dude, as soon as he started getting yelled at, he bitched the fuck up, tried to go home. <laughs> and then the next few days, he fucking... Luckily, he didn't get sent to my base, so we were, we were put in different fucking companies. <laughs> Bro, I could just imagine he's in there it was like, retarded. my great-great-granddaddy great yeah. was a fucking military sergeant. I was built for this shit. He's as like, let's fucking go. Him, like, this, this dude thought he was so Chad. I'm like, all right, whatever. He fucking, like, he yeah, he, he tried to walk out with his fucking civilian clothes on with a cigarette in his mouth. And the drill sergeant's, like, astonished. Like, <laughs> like what are you doing, like, man? You Come on. Where the fuck are you going to go, bro? This is, you're on a military base. Like, there's force everywhere in fucking bumfuck Georgia. You're Where the fuck are you going to go? Right now. Are you going to honestly sit at a bus stop and wait for the bus to pick your stupid ass up? Like, really? Like, you, you came this far? And so, there's a lot of people like that. <laughs> So we were there for 11 days, got the fuck out of there, went to basic, you know, got there, fucking, we all, like, your soul, the last for your social is an easy way to identify you. It's a pretty easy way for someone to know who the fuck they are, now, completely fucking it up most of the time, so, we had to put, like, our tags with our last four, and so, the drill sergeants had us put all of our fucking bags into a cattle truck, like, a fucking, like, a trailer, where, like, you tow and just bullshit yeah. and we got on a bus and I got on the bus I'm like towards the front so I don't know how the fuck I ended up there and so my MOS was 11 Bravo which is infantry and so the other losers on the other side of the yeah, bay we were infantry, but... yeah well, infantry and the other losers on the other side of the bay were 11 Charlies All I could have been in 11 Charlie myself but it's just having to be like okay everyone sitting over there is going to be a Charlie everyone over there is a Bravo I'm like alright whatever and for those of you at home that don't know, Eleven Charlie is also an infantryman. They wear the blue cord. They go to the same place in basic, but they employ indirect fire with various sizes of mortars, like 82s, like, you know, through a tube. Just, boom. Dang. Through trajectory. That's so that's a mortarman. That's what they are. So 
I was in that. And so we got in our bus, and I'm sitting there, and this fucking short, fucking buff ass dude with his uniform, and a lot of people in the army will display their badges, like and their skills, like on their uniform. So this dude had the device big to show flights, that, yeah, he had he had some big dick energy, fucking <laughs> right here. He had the device that showed that he was in combat, which is a combat infantryman badge. Which for that, Respect. if you're an infantryman, you get the CIB, which is a long blue rifle with a wreath under it. And he had airborne, and he had air assault, which is are two schools. Airborne, you jump out of planes. So if I got a homie Max and um, airborne, shout out to him. Hey. Fucking and aerosol is where you just run out of helicopters and then you sling load and attach shit to a helicopter. But those are the two schools that you can wear in your uniform. And then he had a special forces tab, which is you got to get selected to be special forces. Oh, yeah. You got to make it through two and a half years of training, pretty much. Your balls have to be this big. Pretty much, <laughs> you need some serious BDE to get through, you know. But. And he had his ranger tab, which is another fucking, I believe, three-month school with three three different phases throughout, like, Georgia and Florida, where you're being tested on the true skills of the standard of the ranger handbook, which is pretty much showing you basic war fighting in every aspect. So he got them two stacks, and obviously has his duty patch, which shows that he's a drill sergeant. On the other side, the special forces deployment patch shows that he didn't just get his his shit in combat he got a shit in combat with fucking sf guys i was like shit so this That's dude walks in front of me i'm like holy fuck and he's quiet he's like we get all we go where we're going just probably down the street fort benning and then he's just like get off my bus privates <laughs> everyone gets the fuck off and then that's when the fucking shit show starts we just start getting fucking yelled at by a bunch of grown-ass men this is before when it was a lot of the female integration was implemented, so there's a lot more males, especially for infantry, because back then infantry was purely men. Now it's their females are allowed to join, but before it was just all just angry, pissed off fucking drill sergeants that were just ready to get the fuck off of work and go to the gym, fucking wrestle some pre workout and fucking talk about Afghanistan, like you know, like <laughs> some real chads. Eat These guys are just fucking the powder, yeah, those those type of guys probably pissed off that they got to fucking work late because of us watching a bunch of 18 year olds and so they're yelling at us we have Taking our bags on you, yeah. yeah we have our bags in a fucking pile we're like literally fucking trying everybody's trying to find their fucking bag bro everyone is chaos and, <laughs> and then they're counting down bro we didn't make the time hack and we start fucking doing push-ups bro we, we're just doing push-ups and push-ups and we get our bags dude and we're doing a layout of all our shit all this stuff got issued in reception like your fucking uniforms or or Camelback, which is a device that you wear on your back that has water, water in it. In it's hot as fucking Georgia. And you're running around. You're getting your dick smoked. You're going to have to drink a lot of water. <laughs> That's how I learned, like, the true hydration. value of hydration right there, gentlemen. All that Ladies sweat, man. You yeah. got to put it right back you in got here. You, you have to fucking supplement it, you know, and you have to survive. And so we're, we're all just basically prisoners, you know, who signed up to be there, getting fucking yelled at, doing tasks, and we have, like, different phases where we end up doing training, obstacle courses, hand grenades, you have to pass. You have to pass every fucking like thing. You have to get a go. Okay. You know, you're checking the boxes to make sure this person's competent to be able to be called a soldier, let alone an infantryman. And so my infantry was all fourteen weeks. It was one station unit training, which means it was all in the one go. So some jobs in the military, so you might go to Fort Jackson where a lot of similar infantry folks would call Anyone not infantry pogues, which is personnel other than grunts, which is kind of a, it's kind of a dumb term because they all go to work just like we do. Yeah, you know, don't. But it's kind of like you know, a way. It's to, it's just a pride thing. A flex so, thing on. Yeah, so they, they would go. So someone could be a cook, and they'll go to Fort Jackson, and they'll go. I don't know where fucking cooks go. They Fort Eustis. Oh, that's kind of like it's the a. Hierarchy, there's a break in between actually. it. Yeah. We're gonna talk about the hierarchy later when mm -hmm. we talk about psychology and your experience with psychology. Uh, the way that you said that there's like. 
the way that the military people, even though they do the same work you do, you kind mm-hmm. of categorize yourselves differently yeah, based just, on the hierarchical, has a different job. Yeah, hierarchical yeah. things. These people get more respect than they do. Well, why? There's yes. not really a reason why. It's just yes. because they get more respect than they do. That's just how it works, you know? Yeah, it's, it's um, very, very, very But political. speaking of that, you talked about um, some members of the military that you saw with many badges who have been in combat for special forces. You talked about... Um, how you saw other infantry members who were kind of cocky going in and then it showed their true colors when, yeah, they, yeah, when the definitely. pressure was put on them. Yeah. How do you think the overall morale of soldiers in the, the military is? New soldiers such as yourself, do you are you guys going in there ready to represent the U.S. military proudly? Are, are a majority of people going in there just kind of for the benefits or because they had no other option? So the, a lot of people were there for different reasons. So once you're done and you you turn blue, which is a term when we once you pass everything, you have the right to call yourself an infantryman because someone from your family will come up, pin your blue cord on your class A's, which is the black coat before the new one that they just brought back. They put it on. You're an infantryman. You have like two days to fuck off and hang out with your family. Go to like Ranger Joe's or IHOP, Waffle House, you know, like all the other boots in town, you know. But after that, you get sent, and then I, right after graduation, said goodbye to my family. Yeah, goodbye to my family. Got on the bus, and I got orders to Fort Stewart, which is on the other side. So, if anybody at home familiar with Georgia, the Fort Stewart is towards the Atlantic coast on the savannah side of the state and so right there or swamps hot weather heat you know like that's where i was going so we took a bus there it was like what five hours and then i got to reception and then the guy who picked us up from the airport in savannah was cool he was a specialist which is an e4 which is like you're still not shit but you're kind of senior and you can kind of get away with a lot so you're just you're you're just there. So he picked us up. We we're like, oh, like, is this guy like gonna like yell at us for anything? Like we got our bags, and we're in like fucking uniforms, so like class A's. Or if it's during the summer, you'll wear your white short sleeve, but it's like dress uniform. Yeah. So we have our bag. All we have is our fucking bags and our civilian bag and our shoes that we brought. The only thing that you were probably allowed to bring from your life as a civilian was a backpack and shoes, running shoes. Maybe even like vans or something, but all I had was that. And so we get there, we get to like the reception area, they told us. I graduated Veterans Day. So luckily, it was a fucking four day weekend, boys and girls. And so I got there. And then one of the sergeants, he was a staff sergeant, we were like, we were all like, oh shit, like we gotta fucking go to parade arrest. Basically, you put your hands behind your back when you're talking to someone that outranks you in the army. Yeah. in the marines and i'm sure other branches as well so he was like whatever relax man like means like just at ease listen yeah l- listen there and just listen to what i'm fucking telling you so he was like all right uh just show back up here at 6 30 tuesday morning it was wednesday i'm like what wednesday or no 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 monday morning what the fuck you mean we have the day off? We're like, yeah. We're like, okay. We all got barracks rooms. Like, there's a bunk bed, and so yours is there. But you don't have to fucking wake up to someone turning the lights on, fucking banging on a trash can, telling you to wake the fuck up. You, you know, guys like, got a little you, break from yeah, all the... Yeah, like, I got to sleep in. You know, like, I'm a super boot. I'm walking around with fucking issued shit, non-issued shit that I just bought at the store, you know. And then from there is whenever... I pretty much began my life in Fort Stewart, you know. And I was there for three and a half years, and I met some great fucking people, fantastic fucking people, and some dog shit people, like people I could have gone and on without, you know. But yeah. I met them for a reason, you know. Like, and it is what it is. But yeah. Well, going back to it, what would you say the overall morale is for soldiers? Do you think people are in there? You know, feeling ready for war. If we had to go to war right now as the United States, do you think that 
our army would be ready to fight? Are they actually in the mind state to fight? Are they ready to kill? No. Are they really to take a life? Or are they ready to actually die in combat? Let me tell you. So right now, at this moment in time, they have nerfed the fuck out of the U.S. military compared to when I've been in. I'm but not. I'm not going to be one of those guys that's been like, oh, back in my day. Like, no. Like, I notice the difference because I'm not. I'm not sexist. I'm not saying anything. But after they started integrating females in the infantry, and they started a lot of this drama where, you know, they didn't meet the standard or whatever, and then things stemmed from there where they started changing things that shouldn't have been changed. Where so that they could meet the standard. Yeah, where a lot of fucking softer people were getting in because they wanted numbers, and so people who shouldn't have been in the military at all somehow were getting through the ranks. And then the just the normal people who just wanted to fucking serve their country, you know, for whatever reason, like, honorably, had to deal with. So, a lot of the fucking policies that the military is going with today and their leaders is just... It's ruining I, the morale and it's, the it's environment ruin, yeah, of the military. It's, it's ruining the morale. A lot of these general officers that, like, have command over entire bases, like, that come up with just these stupid-ass fucking like policies like i think there's this one i seen on facebook where a general officer who was uh he was in charge of a army base and he made it where if someone is about to get out of the military if they have the amount of days off on their on, on their record that they can take that they're allowed he only gave them like 30 days and so the dude can have like 60 days and so those other days wouldn't mean shit and so he can't like get out sooner and figure out his plan from there you know and so like shit like that we're like you're fucking doing shit for no reason and it's like just so other leaders like someone can get their fucking star or someone right. can be a fucking star major included. of a fucking type of command you know like like, a lot of people, like, senior leaders, like, I don't think look out for the younger, you know, subordinate troops, like, enlisted and junior officers, you know? Like, so a lot of us would be like, oh, whatever, it's just bullshit, you know? Like, a lot of us would be like, ah, oh, fuck, we're going to the field for two weeks, whatever. Go to the field, come back, you know? get off of work once everything's turned in everything's accounted for they tell us to fuck off they tell us to safety brief they tell us hey don't do stupid shit don't hit your wife don't beat your dog don't drive drunk don't do drugs and you know pretty much they Kinda just they tell off. us the same shit after we're done that's the safety brief in the military is the safety you know they 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 have to tell you to don't do dumb shit but well, people not, do, dumb do they really, there. like, consider your mental while you're in there? Would you consider, especially now as a psych major, do you think there's um, an emphasis on making sure people are psychologically well in the military? So, luckily, we're very resourceful. And so we had access to a lot of stuff. So if anybody had the need to want to see someone in behavior health, they would just enroll in behavior health themselves. Like, I see. So there's, they, they would there's have the resources choice. They, to talk yeah, to. Yeah, like to. anybody, they don't have to, you know, be going through something traumatic. If they they just want another another way to help themselves feel better, they can go see a behavioral health specialist, which could either be a civilian or someone that has that military degree. experience. Yeah, dealing with. But military. they're in the military. Yeah, they they're they're either captains and they're they have their PhDs and they're psychologists too. So you can. You could see either one. Anybody can go and talk to them. So that's that a, that's what well, I like. It's good about to it. hear. At least there is those resources for the military. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. because a lot of people have this idea in their heads that the military is kind of left out to dry. I have seen um, some members of the military who are kind of um, like retired vets and they're homeless now and they're kind of left out to dry, which I think is something um, we should probably look into mm -hmm. and see what we can do about it. If yeah. there is something we can do about exactly. it, exactly. But. Um, other than that, it is good to hear that the resources are there um, from someone who's experienced in it and seen it, that there mm -hmm. at least is somewhere that you felt that you could go if you had some some bad shit going on in your mind or head. You could yeah, it go was and cool. Experience it. Like, but going back to the um, battle-ready questions, mm -hmm. do you feel like 
you personally were ready for battle? Do you think that if it was called upon you, you would be ready to take someone's life in the name of the United States or die in the name of the United States? I mean, I did join the Army to serve my country, and I felt that was something honorable. And I'm not going to call myself a badass and be like, yeah, I'll, I'll fucking go in there and fucking kick the Taliban's yeah. door down with I'm fucking flip-flops right and now. shit. Like, no, I'd be like, okay. Oh, like, I generally thought, like, hey, you know, like, wherever I get sent to, like, I could get sent to war or I can get sent somewhere else. Like, just want to play your position. I'm just like, okay, like, I'm going to try to fucking pay attention to everything I could so I don't die. But I wasn't, I wasn't scared at all. It's more like my family and my ex-girlfriend at the time who was scared for me. And I'm like, uh, you know, that's kind of like, uh, you know, I don't want to leave my family, but if I have to do it, I have to do it. You know, which, which is interesting because... What made you so um, ready to... Because some people, it's like, our country isn't perfect, you know, there's a lot of problems in it. What makes you so ready to go and put your life on the line for the sake of, you know, democracy in the United States and what it stands mm -hmm. for at its base? So, anyone chooses their job in the military, and generally an infantryman or anyone in combat arms, you know, like whose job is to train to fucking kill somebody, you know, whether you're in a fucking a vehicle or you're on foot and you have to fucking cap someone, you know? Like, yeah. we we all know that's, a, that's what our job is. We're all reminded that's what our fucking job is because we all train for it. We all go to the field, go to ranges, start a training cycle, you know, like... You're reminded train on of weapons. that enemy down. Yeah, like our fucking, thing. like, we used to get fucked up as fucking privates like me and all my friends like yeah so a few guys still talk to this day like growing up as young guys like we'd get fucked up by like our seniors like which was usually like specialists and sergeant and then staff sergeant and staff sergeant was like the guy that's like the boss on top the underboss and then there's a team leader which is our boss those are the guys as a job as a team leader they're supposed to help their younger guys get them fucking ready you know like make sure that they're on their shit and so like we didn't we weren't allowed to have our phones out at all Ever. in the company area like once we got to our unit like we we're like oh fuck like it stopped being chill you know like after when i was talking about like oh we had days off like we went to reception like after reception when you get to your unit and you're done processing and getting all your paperwork you know good like you go to your unit and then your team leaders fucking meet you <laughs> like you're 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 gonna be a miserable fucking kid for a little bit until you know like you eventually earn some respect. You you pull your weight and you know like we weren't allowed to be on our phones. They gave us a piece of paper with a bunch of general infantryman knowledge as like everything from M4 to M249 to 240 to the range of hand grenade and like shit like that and like different infantrymen stuff like different battle battle formations and troop leading procedures and stuff like that like stuff you you could see in a ranger handbook that they'd want you to know and so like that's all we were allowed to look at like you're sitting there from the time so we'd go we would wake up for pt we have to be there at 5 45 fucking salute the flag 6 30 you know pt's over at either 7.30 or 8 o'clock and then you you have an hour and a half to go to get breakfast you know and then after you show up to work from 9 till the standard is typically 5 o'clock 1700 but it ranges I I can't really remember the time I got off at fucking 17 especially my last time I kind of just did whatever the fuck I want but yeah. like you just went to work and you're looking at your fucking Joe sheet and if your fucking leader came out from smoking a cigarette or just bored and he's stuck at work he's gonna pick up your sheet and he's like alright since you're looking at this he's gonna ask you he's like what are the troop leading procedures start and questioning like, oh. and, and you, you fuck up you, you say automatically you, you get the question wrong you're pushing you're doing burpees you're doing flutter kicks like or you're playing fuck fuck games you know like like they have private olympics or they get bored and they just make all the fucking joe's do like races and fucking crab walks across the pavement to see who's more athletic. To Demoralizing see, yeah, stuff. Yeah, type of thing. like yeah. thing to be like, man, what the fuck? 
shit, you know? But that shit's necessary because it makes you a fucking man and calces you to be the fucking... The way you should be when Just you play. stay in and you keep guys for yourself. You pass it on and you make them hard and you get them ready, you know? It's like, this job don't fuck around, you know? Like, wherever you get sent to... It's not meant to be taken lightly. Yeah. Especially. Well, speaking of the the discipline and the schedule and things that you went through the reg the regimen, like you said, um, before we started, we talked a little bit before we started about some things. Um, what would you say the greatest benefit of the military was for you? What did you gain most, or if there were several of them, just what were things that changed your life or make you who you are today that came from the military experience? So, I want to say the biggest thing is just life experience like I was in for around six years you know I got out at like over five and a half but it's easier to say six and five and a half I guess round it out <laughs> but uh, yeah so life experience you know I've met a lot of people I've been around a lot of different environments you know I've had roles to fill Traveling, huh? yeah I've, I've traveled a few places just a few you know but I've had Tremendous responsibility. I've had, you know, like, I've had to deal with a bunch of stupid shit, you know, like, and so it gave me that kind of, like, like you said, callous, life like, I'm like, hey, like, I've been there, done that, I've done a few things, like, I'm, like, you know, like, I feel like it, I'm using that to help me prepare, like, for this transition that I'm going through to be smooth, you know, which... Doing well, doing well so far. So Understanding you know. how to solve different processes in your life. That's yeah. what you say the biggest benefit would be is now you have some type of foundation for how to go about handling mm-hmm. different challenges yeah, and I, situations. Yeah. That's what's up. What would you say the dip, the biggest cons would be? Um, things that you missed out on or lost or things that were harmful about the military, if there was anything. Damn. Well, I did miss out on a lot of stuff that went back home, you know. Here in Cali, I miss a lot of birthdays, and um, I was with someone before, uh, and then I missed out on, obviously, anniversaries, birthdays, you know, stuff like that, and then with family, you know, like, I would have wanted to go to stuff that they're doing, like family reunions and stuff. That stuff always kind of sucks, but, you know, everyone's always going to feel homesick, you know? It's hard to balance um, relationships, in other words. It's It's kind of all about you at that point in the military and Mm -hmm. your responsibility. You can't really focus on um, balancing relationships with other people. Yeah, and you're just, like, no matter what, at the end of the day, if you're in the military, you're still in the military. There's no other way to get around it. Like, you can't, like... You can't just do whatever the fuck you want. You're gonna be held accountable, you know. You can't just you can't smoke weed. You can't go out and fucking drive drunk. Or you have a responsibility. Yeah, you have responsibilities. You have a standard, you know. Like you're fucking like you're being paid to wear a uniform, and so that's like yeah. you're expected to be an adult. But Hold up I met a lot of people that like weren't said, fucking yeah. that weren't adults at all. You're, you're representing more than just yourself. You're representing the the military. Yeah, exactly. You know, like yeah. you, you know, you got a fucking flag on on your shoulder that shows like we represent. Like, but Respect. it is what it is, you know. But aside from that, you talked about travel. Where where did you travel? Where are the places that you've been, and where was so, the the best place you've been? Worst place you've been? So what's funny is whenever I was in Fort Stewart. Um, probably like annually. Well, this time it wasn't annually. Um, we're supposed to get sent to places to go on training trips, month long training trips. But in like, what's the what's the word I want to use? For lack of a better term, wholesale. So an entire combat brigade will go to either Louisiana at uh, Fort Polk, which is like a fucking swamp shit hole. Or they get sent to the Mojave Desert, off, off of the 15 in Barstow, California. Damn, he said the Mojave Desert. Yeah, <laughs> and you're there training in the desert to go fucking pretend to fight the Russians. You know, like, and so you get sent there. No one wants to fucking go. That shit's a pain in the ass because you got to get all your fucking shit ready. You have to 
chain up all your equipment, put it on trains. Of course, they send all the privates, so we're there from like five in the morning to like six in that six in the evening. So we're like chaining shit up. So that shit goes there. So I I went to California twice when I was still living in Georgia for a training trip to Fort Irwin, which is actually the place I've been at the last two years. Where I chose to go after so I could be close. But that's where we went. That's where we were there training for a month to fucking play in the desert. We would go out for two weeks to fucking LARP military fucking role playing like and all of our equipment yeah, everything we brought you're fighting blanks, through battle scenarios and fucking like everything we're sleeping on mountains we're doing all that shit and we're training and so that's what we're there for we went twice in a year we weren't supposed to but we went twice in a year so we can get ready to go to South Korea what yeah so you were in Korea for a little while yeah I was in Korea I was there for nine months wow mm-hmm. and this was End of seventeen, early twenty eighteen. What was know. the what was it like being in Asian territory for so long? So the political climate before we got sent there, like our our fucking battalion commander was telling everybody in formation before everybody went home for the weekend, like, man, you're going over there to represent the United States of America and to deter North Korean aggression. And if those fuckers come over the border and try to invade. You guys are going to go over there and fuck them up. I <laughs> guarantee you guys will fight North Korea and unify the South. You know, that kick them up. They were giving us some, like, go-to-war shit. Part of, me, part of me believed it. Part of me was like, eh, whatever. And so, that's yeah, we're, we're there. We, <laughs> I guess that's where we're going. So that was in 2018. So we flew out. We got all of our shit packed. It was a huge pain in the ass. Anytime you're going anywhere in the military, you have to pack your shit up. And it's work. So once everything was done, eventually the day came where we're flying out. And so we flew from Hunter Army Airfield in Savannah out to Alaska. Laid over in Alaska. From Alaska to South Korea. Yeah, it was like a fucking 14 hour flight. Been, so you've been. Uh, did you travel only for training or did you do any it, it traveling was, for. It was a deployment. Just, did you travel any just to travel? Did you have a chance to go anywhere just for yourself? Oh, well, leisure. Me and my buddies. So we were in on the Atlantic Coast side. We'd go to Savannah and then the ocean and Tybee Island. Beautiful, you know, little island and then cool spots, bars, restaurants, and then a lot of guys would go to Alabama. You know, if they really wanted to go, a lot of us went to Florida. Florida was fun. We went to Jacksonville, you know, That's just right. linked up with a bunch of buddies that were also going there from another unit. I've heard stuff about Florida recently. Yeah, a lot of my friends, you know, chose to live out there. You know, I got a buddy that's a um, firefighter, and then I got a buddy that's a sheriff out there. They're both of my homies. I used to party out there. Hey, Kramer and Daniels, hey, shout out to you guys. Fucking, but yeah. Like, a lot of them chose to stay in Florida after they got out of the military, who got out on the first term. But, you know, that's pretty much just where we went. And then we went local. We went to, like, Georgia Southern or, like, other schools to party, you know, hang out with yeah. on, like, Saturday, Friday nights. It was cool. So we talked a little bit about being ready for battle and killing people. Um, did you receive any type, or I'm sure you did, obviously, but... What kind of training did you have with guns? Extensive training did you have with guns? And um, are you a gun owner now? Do you still own guns? I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what's up. Yeah, I definitely am a huge advocate for the Second Amendment, along with every other right that was given to us um, as yeah. American citizens. But yeah, so the type of training, obviously, in basic training, they they familiarize you with classes and then. They actually give you a rifle without ammo, and then you're learning how to hold it. You're, like, learning body positions because there's fundamentals of marksmanship where it's your breathing, your body position, your sight picture, you know, like, you have to make sure, like, you're not fucking shaking like a dog before you right, get rid of you're pulling fucking, the trigger. Yeah, you just you, you squeeze. That's cool, body yeah. positions and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, like, crouching, um, going prone. 
Yeah. Standing and so mounted these different a things. A lot of what was most important is what they really hammer into people is safety. So obviously when you have a loaded weapon, keep that shit pointed down or fucking don't point at anybody, you know? Right. Like if you have a loaded weapon, you know, go somewhere where you're supposed to use it at safely. You know, don't and have a loaded weapon it, around a bunch of people unless you're fucking like a cop or like someone professional. Right. And but, even if it's not loaded, treat it. Yeah, as treat as it's treat it like it's not loaded. Just check it. You know, all you gotta do is just check it. And be like, all right, whatever. You know, it's not gonna fire back. Like how all these fucking stupid asses fucking say, Alec Baldwin. Yeah. But yeah, so they hammer into us like. Safety, safety, safety. Guys at the range and basic, they fucking out of whatever reflex they they turn sideways. Their barrels pointed towards everybody else on the line. The fucking drill sergeant comes and fucking knocks them off their fucking ass, yelling, "What the fuck are you doing? Put your fucking weapon away. Keep it shit pointed down." Yeah. Like so, safety along with the you know shooting. So they they it's the bare minimum. You know, like you gotta qualify with an M4 and then it's iron sights and then just a red dot just a normal red dot and so That's when you cool. get to your unit you have iron sights a red dot a holographic or an ACOG if you're special forces or like soft or anybody with a nice unit budget you're obviously going to get like Gucci fucking guns and optics but optics, you know we're yeah. I was conventional army You've you know we just got the normal all different shit. of those with iron sights and yeah, with red dot the, the, and the, shit, the shit that people would probably buy for their own gun like just learning how to use yeah. those so safely. Use we them. we had training cycles. Basically, it's just a long period of time where they have events planned. They have to do a training. Like we'll start off with ranges. We'll have M4 ranges. I'll get all the dudes qualified. 240 ranges. The machine gun. 7.62. Fucking get everybody qualified. Shoot at night. Shoot with on night vision goggles with the the laser because all of our weapons have night vision lasers sitting next to a trained killer homie was ready to take him out <laughs> homie was ready to take him out <laughs> then we just have our ranges and once the range is out of the way we have exercises where we have like we do team or like we work with our team where we do it like with blanks and then once they feel we're ready we do it live and then we have people watching us and grading us kind of telling us how we are and it moves up from team squad platoon Platoon's like your group of guys, one of the main groups in a, a company that like you're supposed to be close with with all your guys. Everybody has a role, you know. Everybody has like a leader, and so you get to that level. And we had vehicles, we had heavy vehicles, and so we train in those fucking pieces of shit, which are just big Bradleys, which are big vehicles that had a track on the bottom, and it had a 25 millimeter. Yeah, just like that. I had a 25 millimeter cannon, and I had a 240 Charlie, which a Charlie is a 240 that's meant to be mounted in vehicles such as a Bradley. And so they had that. So they had we had boys that that's that's what their job was. And so and we our job, we were on the ground. We we're the dismounts, and so we trained for all that. And so we went to the field a lot, and then we trained with. Miles gear, which the best way to explain it is basically like expensive laser tag that doesn't really work most of the time. It's basically like a vest, like, like you'll see like a green vest with like black dots on it, and then on your weapon you'll put a BFA, which it's either red or yellow, and it's just something you screw on on your fucking barrel. So if you see somebody with a BFA, a, a yellow block on their fucking weapon. And then they said they're doing like fucking hood rat shit. Don't believe them, because it's you got some kush too. Oh yeah. You want to throw it in the blunt? Yes, sir. We're about to roll up, man. Oh, yeah. Have us a little smoke too. We smoked before we started. It's good vibes. Yes, sir. Like I said, bro, I really some pancake. Appreciate... Hell yeah. I really appreciate you coming, yep. Drew. Yes, sir. Smoke with me. Bro. I appreciate you hosting me, sir. Good conversation. Yep. So Here you go, bro. We, we talked a lot about the military. What was your um? When it came to that fork in the road decision to enlist or not enlist again for another, it's four years, right? The contract. It's like three and a half. Three and a half. Okay. Mm -hmm. What made you um, decide that you were going to come home and live the civilian life for a little while? So, 
I actually re-enlisted once. I I did two terms. Um, I re-enlisted in 2019 after I got home from leave. I don't know why my stupid ass felt motivated and like, hey, I'm gonna re-enlist. I didn't talk to anybody about it. I didn't consult anybody. I didn't weigh my weigh out my options. I said I'm gonna re-enlist and I'm gonna, you know, try to be a fucking savage or whatever. <laughs> But Straight I kind of, I kind of. You were thinking about a career in the army at that point. I, I think so. You know, I don't know what kind of clouded me because I did. If you're gonna reenlist, if you're listening to this and you're in the military, you know, if you want to reenlist, talk to the people that that shit would directly affect the people that support you. See how it works out in the long run for you. Because if you're not happy, then what the fuck's the point? Yeah, talk to the people you trust. Communicate with. Yeah. And so, what, what drove your decision to decide to come back home? So after I reenlisted, I left. I left Georgia, twenty twenty. Came home around January fifteenth, and came back to Cali. Came back to the IE. Bought a car. You know, waiting for my date to report because I was still on vacation. So I had a. In between some time where they you travel you to know, different, huh? they'll tell you like this is the day your ship. Yeah, they'll they'll give you your orders way ahead of time, and then you take time like you take vacation days like like I was talking about where you have those days like saved up if you want to take them before you get out of the military for your transition, or if you reenlist and you want to take them for days in between you getting to your next place, that's what you could do with them. So I took some time off, came back here. And fucking COVID started. So and as soon as you got back? As soon as I got back from Cali. Oh, actually, my sister, my older sister, she she had gotten married in 2020, in February. And so I was there for a little bit. I was like, okay, you know, this is whatever. You know, I can get used to this because I, I was up there about an hour and a half away from where we are now. And so it was, I, I would just drive back and forth, you know, a lot of gas, a lot of commuting but i made it work and then fucking covid hit after my sister's wedding after i flew out a weekend to texas i got back dude shit started getting like locking down like flights are getting delayed because of the fucking pandemic shit and yeah. so i just i got back here to cali once all that shit started and from there you know that's how I, that's how we are here you know? it's kind of just yeah you flowed back into being here and after you got back the yeah, the whole COVID thing was, started, and yeah, it was like, man, now I might as well just stay here because this whole thing's going on. Well, I stayed in the military and came here because I wanted to feel like what it would be like to do both. And so I did that, and then COVID happened, and so I kind of had to, like, it wasn't really a normal experience because for a while it was like what they nobody was going guys. to work. As the military, they were like it was, how did dude. It was it was it? locked down for a while, dude. Because I was still single at the time, completely single, We're broken off from you know before, and so it was just like a fresh start for me. And so I was just a young dude. I was still in, I was an E four, you know. So I was like, all right, uh, here we go. And so we were locked down. We were in our rooms. We would communicate through WhatsApp. We'd send ups in the morning to make sure we were alive. And then we were just, like, in our rooms or in our houses, like, just in there. That's crazy. Yeah. Because a lot of people assume, like, it only affected our society. And it's like, no, oh, this, no. this affected the military. the military. It affected everybody. Um, everybody it's, was affected it's by It's still, COVID to this the day, day, a fucking huge deal in the military. The way The COVID barracks is and stuff is set up, too. Yeah, so I lived on a three-story barracks where you don't have to... Normally, you, the way the building is, you have to check in with somebody on duty before you go up, but there's a stairway on the outside, and anybody kind of just did, but I just stayed in my room and just played Xbox. I stayed in my room. I, I love video games, too. I'm a gamer. You know, like, that's how I grew up. It so got, got me through. Yeah. It got me through along with <laughs> dating apps. <laughs> Oh, uh, dude, we're, we're all bored. Some type, yeah, yeah, bro. Bored. As if you're gonna see someone in a fucking pandemic, like, hey, everybody's on their phone, whatever. You know, that's what I was thinking. So I, I was basically just, I was, I was working out a lot too. Like I was doing, I wasn't going to the gym because gyms are closed. So there's across the street from where I work, there's a little sand, sand pit, and there's pull up bars and shit like that. So 
you know, I did a, some prison type exercises. I use the pull-up bars, use the heavy fucking like rock I seen. Like yeah. not really um, weights, but yeah. just like natural. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I'd go into the chow hall, get my food, then go back to my room, fucking eat my food, play fucking, what was I playing at the time? I was playing a lot of Yakuza. Yakuza oh, no, Zero, no. Yakuza Kiwami. Yakuza slept on, bro. Yakuza. I mean, it's famous within a small community, yeah. but it's like that game. Se way Sega up. has a masterpiece series called Yakuza. So Yakuza, I played okay. that, and then I was on dating apps. Let's see. I was I, I used a lot of dating apps from that time, and I got banned off of right Tinder. COVID. I, I got banned off of Tinder because some fucking chick was trying to like get me to like pay for some shit. And I think it was a scammer, and I called it out, and then they reported me, and somehow my shit got deleted forever. I'm like, whatever, dude. Like, unless I get a new number, like, I can't use it again, which I don't like, care. Like, a snitch. <laughs> For real, I'm like, whatever. And so, and then I used Hinge and Bumble, and then I actually, I didn't really end up meeting any, any women because I just, I just talked to a few girls, whatever. Like, and like it was just pandemic, so I didn't really have, to, I had to try to go see somebody. Until I ended up it takes a lot, especially yeah. during COVID. It's like, well, are you vaccinated? Yeah, yet? dude. And you I, got a max on. I live in <laughs> I lived on Fort Irwin, where it was thirty miles to the fucking freeway from the base itself, and around that it's just a road, a fucking road where dirt cops sit on, fucking just nothing, dirt road you can haul ass on if no one's there. Like, it's that. So I was, I'm like, I have to go out of my way to see somebody, but one day someone caught my eye. And ended up talking to them. We were just about to talk about this next. Man, yeah. Is, is marriage and relationships and finding connectivity with somebody. I'm assuming that's what you were heading into is your, your mm -hmm. current relationship. Yeah, that's actually how I ended up meeting my wife. Huh. Through a dating app. Yeah, nothing romantic, but the fuck, what the fuck ever, you know. And the China virus Especially, shuts everything yeah. down. What, what, am, what am I going to do? So we're back. I had to take a little restroom break. We got the blunt rolled up. We talked about the military. Let's scoot this over a little bit. Boom. We talked about the military. We talked about your life in the military, life before high school, how we met in high school, life in high school. Mm -hmm. um, you were just carrying on about your um, recent relationship and marriage. I wanted to ask you about marriage. I don't want to ask you if you're happy or not, because obviously you are. You're married. Oh, man, all yeah, good. you all got good. your your partner. Um, I'm married as well, so I know what it's like. But for the people who don't know what it's like to be married, what sort of um, emphasis or what what is special about marriage to you and connecting with somebody? What stands out to you about having somebody there um, by your side that is living their life with yours mm -hmm. now? So it's best way I can describe it is just a strong partnership where you truly value that person you love them to the deepest extent that you know like you and you just you you just want to succeed with the person and they're they're your person forever you know like your significant one and so they don't There's you don't necessarily have to be married to be connected to somebody but marriage like ultimately like that's like you choose to be with somebody forever, along with legally being with somebody by law. But marriage is special. And that, that's sort of what I was talking about. I had a recent episode on Valentine's Day where I talked about my marriage and my idea as a marriage um, from a Satanist perspective. And I was basically saying that you don't need marriage, like you just said, to um, like solidify your relationship. But it's a way of showing your trust to this person that you are now... Um, you guys are on the same page and you're in it together type of thing and you both understand that you're in it together you know it's just it's this understanding that's why I ask about connectivity do you feel like there's this deep connectivity with marriage that you can't really find um, anywhere else because mm -hmm. I feel that way I, I talk to my friends you included about deep things but it's like at the end of the day nobody knows what's going on with me better than me and my wife yeah would exactly. you say the same thing yeah you know along with the people that you have close to you that obviously you know like may know about any issues that you know family. amongst you and your family yeah like but 
just sharing that bond with somebody it's like it's special and that's your partner for life and like you know like you're number two you know like what that's would, your ace what advice would you give to um newlywed men when it comes to balancing things uh balancing their relationship um because we all have responsibilities um in a relationship you're dealing with two people you have to understand her she has to understand you um what advice would you give what comes first and foremost i know most people say communication but aside from communication what would you say is the most important thing you want to pass it or here i'll pass it to her oh here you go my lovely wife yes, speaking sir. of wives is here come on over mom come on over it's a good pearl blunt <laughs> but I'd so say... What, what would you say is the most important aspect of keeping a relationship together? I'd say is just supporting one another. Like, just anytime they feel like they, they have the passion and want to do something, just go out there and just tell them, like, hey, like, fuck yeah, like, you can do that shit, you know? Like, just motivate them. And then honesty, you know, like, don't hide shit, you know? Just because if you start off with not wanting to, like... <laughs> tell your wife anything at the beginning of a marriage you know like what's who's to tell what the hell is that going to turn into so it really does come back to communication and honesty yeah just being they, open. they all connect together it's just I, w I would say you know just just being real you know being a good husband or a good wife it goes both ways you know support each other and do great things that's what it's supposed to be what do you think about the because you say husband and wife what do you think about the religious ideal of marriage when it comes to like traditional marriage? Um, things like in Islam, organized marriage, yeah. um, are things like in um, Christian or Catholicism, traditional marriage such as man and woman, do you think that there is some sort of um, underlying issue mm -hmm. with um, not homosexuality but marriage as a whole? Because it's yeah. like you could be um, acceptive of gay marriage but still think that over a long period of time it would be harmful to humanity where do you fall on the side of the spectrum of marriage especially mm -hmm. in keeping things traditional as far as what we teach our kids yeah. and what we're passing on generationally mm -hmm. so I mean let me start off with if, if you're in a forced marriage and you have no choice I would hope that you like whoever they're pairing you up with but um, that's that's because of other countries' cultures, and I'm not gonna speak on that because I didn't grow up in a country that is like that. But I appreciate that. Like we yeah. have to appreciate that people didn't live where we live, and their laws aren't what we believe in. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when it comes to people speaking on behalf of like Islamic traditions or Middle Eastern traditions, it's like this isn't here. They don't live yeah. by the same laws we live by, and we can't expect them to hold up the same values that we hold up. You know, we mm -hmm. we have to worry about um, what's going on in the U.S. You know, with yeah. our neighbors. Not everyone, not everybody is saying I do. Some people are saying I have to. <laughs> but I mean, if you choose to marry somebody, like I, I'd hope that you really feel that you have a strong, passionate love for you can be with that person for the rest of your life. You That's know? basically what I was saying in my podcast is that love, I don't think there's any traditional love, like yeah. man and woman. Love is a verb. Man and man, yeah, but it's like, at the end of the day, marriage and relationships are still something that you should take seriously and not just get with anybody just for any type of reason, whether it's a man and a man or a woman and a woman mm -hmm. or a man and a woman. You should understand that relationships are something to value and take seriously that's the way that i feel about it yeah definitely definitely yeah <coughs> thank you sir Woo, getting faded <coughs> good read that pancake <coughs> i think i bought that like last week or week before i just kind of forgot about it still good but yeah. speaking of religion um do you affiliate with any religious belief? Do you consider yourself any part of any organized religion? So I grew up Catholic, and I guess that's why I got sent to Aquinas with you, because yeah. you know, like, I Catholic guess Catholic school. I guess at some point, you know, like, I decided, hey, Catholic school is the way to go. But 
I wasn't really a fan of the way it was kind of shoved down kids' throats. Cause, indoctrination. Yeah, indoctrination. Like, I don't, so whatever. I, I, I didn't really. I feel fake sometimes. So I'm like, man, like, I don't feel like praying, but they're making me pray. You're you know? just doing it to kind of go just along. Just kind of go religion. and wait till they're done, so I can go to lunch. You know, but um, I do believe in God. I do believe that if you do, if you're a good person, that you will be rewarded. Once you die, if you suck, you're probably going to hell. But I don't, I don't go to church. I don't try to strike my beliefs on people. I just, you know, like I respect other people's beliefs. I Those respect are your God. personal ideals. Yeah, and you know, right. like if if I see someone, if I if I pass by a cemetery where I know some of my loved ones are, or somewhere where someone I know may have died, I'll do a sign of the cross and just think about them, send them a quick prayer. I'm good, but what does the uh, the sign of the I'm cross not mean to you? Why why the sign of the cross? So the sign of the cross comes from Catholicism, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I I do believe in that. I do believe that they all became one, you know. And Jesus died for everybody, you know. But as far as I like, I'm not gonna try to fucking tell people. Should I read it from the Bible and fucking talk about it? Or I'm gonna, I'm gonna make people go to church. I don't even go to church. I don't have time for that. Press your beliefs on other yeah. people. Yeah, but if someone does go to church, so then that's cool. You would say you identify as Catholic still till this day, or Christian, or how would you say you identify? I just. You're not, I would just say non, just Christian, non-denominational Christian, Christian type yeah. of thing. You mm -hmm. don't go to any church, but exactly. you practice the Christian beliefs. Yeah, and I, I practice it. Away. Once I feel it's warranted and I respect it, mm -hmm. I, feel what you're I don't. Saying. I don't use God's name in vain or anything like that. So speaking, I of just the, respect. It. Speaking of the existence of God, what convinces you that there is a God? Because I personally, like as you probably know, <coughs> I'm a I'm a Satanist. I stand on the side <coughs> of Satanism and Satanic values of enlightenment, not the traditional what people think is Satanism, but enlightenment. Um, Broadening your view, um, opening your yeah. mind, understanding mm -hmm. a very peaceful form. That's like that type of thing. Yeah, but uh, also I the rebellion that. against traditional norms because that's what Satan was. Um, I identify more with the Satan that is present in the Paradise Lost book than the uh, the devil that is present in the Bible. Paradise mm -hmm. Lost is the story of Satan's fall from heaven. That's where the story comes from. There is no fall from heaven for the devil in the Bible that doesn't exist in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's present in Paradise Lost. And in Paradise Lost, we see Satan falling from heaven, and that describes him as the person who rebelled against God. And that's the Satan that I mainly identify with, is the oh, okay. enlightened, beautiful Satan who rebelled against traditional norms and was cast out of um, quote-unquote heaven for that. So what convinces you that a God exist to the point where you're confident in saying that you believe in one i want to say that things that you may feel that are unanswered like that could be god you know i want to believe that someone is responsible for sending me to somewhere that you know that i deserve to be in the afterlife where I may find peace. I recently and... heard someone say, I think it was Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. that God is all things um, true. Or no, actually it wasn't Jordan Peterson. It was just some priest on a YouTube video that I watched. But <laughs> he said that God is all things true, and we don't know all things that are true yet. So just yeah. think of God as all things that are true, and that we don't know every true thing. So basically God is just the truth. Um, the truth, you hear that, folks? But I understand that. What I don't understand is the God that is present in the Bible, which is the overwatching, omnipotent creator who is deciding that you're having too much sex or jerking off too much. Type yeah, of thing. The, 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 or that the type of shit that judges you. Like... Yeah, like what I don't understand is that sort of God. And people say that that is the Old Testament God, but it is still included in the same Bible that the New Testament is involved in, you know yeah, what I mean? I and at the same time, Jesus didn't come along and say that the Old Testament was wrong and the New Testament is good. He just kind of came along and preached his own message. So um, it goes back to the God thing, the question, um, what 
convinces you that this is somehow divinely inspired and not just a story that man wrote. See, aside from all the fundamentalism and the crazy ass stories that you may read in the Bible, I just feel like it's just a way to keep at peace spiritually. You know, it's just like, hey, like, you know, like you could say, hey, I'm about to. I'm about to go on this long ass drive. I don't know what could happen. You know, like it's your way of. I'd hope you know I'm at peace with whatever, you know, with God, and I may get there safe. You know, just so have extra assurance. So how would you define in. God? What is your characteristics of God? Like, what does it look? How do you define it? You know what I mean? What does it look like? Sound like? What capabilities does it have to influence your life or the world as a whole? I want to say God has the power to create anything that exists in the universe. Like the things behind fucking supernovas and the enormous hurricanes going on on Jupiter. Like that's all everything he created that he just created. He's not. He has no control over it. I noticed so you it's say just something he. that's what makes like you think God is a he. You know what? You're right. You're right. He or she, them. I'm not a fucking pronoun guy. I'm just like <laughs> whatever may exist. Yeah, whatever. To like be God, you know, like I believe God is a creator. It's a, it's the yeah. creator or it's yeah. for me what I the way that I define God, I'm not like I'm probably one of the most um, theological Satanists or atheists that there is. Like, I don't discredit the Bible or religion and say that it's useless. I try to acknowledge the good that it's done. It's, of course, done some bad and started some wars, but plenty yeah. of things have started wars, yeah, you know, not exactly. just religion. So mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. we can't put all of the fault on religion. It has more to do with man and our nature than religion itself. Mm -hmm. But I've I noticed that Theologically speaking, religion, the good that we can get from religion, we seem to be able to get it without religion, if you ask me. Especially yeah. as someone as a psych major, it's like the things that you're talking about, the admiration for the universe, the um, humble spirit to know that you don't know everything and that there's more than you could ever know or that we do know. I feel mm -hmm. like we could accept those things as truthful without saying that there is some type of creator behind it. That's where I personally struggle with the God argument because it's like I could understand that there's more than I know or will know or that anyone on the planet knows, but that doesn't mean yeah. that Who someone, knows? Yeah, that doesn't mean Who that somebody knows? else made it is is my mm -hmm. thing. So yeah. that's, that's why just I, coming from a the least religious guy. <laughs> so yeah. Pretty much. Just so still on the spiritual. religious subject, where do you think humans get their morality from um, good and bad and psychologically speaking since you're a psych major do you think that the bible is somewhere that we honestly get good and bad the idea of good and bad from or do we have our own um, objective morality separate from the bible because so, I feel like we could read the bible um, beginning to end right now mm -hmm. and decide what inside the Bible is quote-unquote good and bad using our 2022 yeah. morality. So it's like, if that's the case, then the Bible isn't teaching us anything if we're deciphering like it's a guideline it. Yeah, yeah, if we're breaking it down, then it's no longer what's teaching us. It's something that's to be dissected, is what I feel like. So where do you feel like human morality comes from? So, personally, I don't think that there's anything spiritual that has to do with the way that humans feel that way. There's nature and then there's nurture, you know? Like, some some humans are born to feel a certain way and say someone could be born to be a fucking... an NBA fucking legend, you know? Like, they're good at basketball and then that's what they're passionate about, you know? And they don't... That could be because someone in their life wanted them to be that way. But then there's also people that, like, 
have no explanation of why they act a certain way and it's like oh you know I, this is just how I am like there's no explanation about it and so I just think that comes from just the way that they process different things through their through their brain as they may be th- developing throughout their life and so experiences they may have and so some people may tie that in with religion and use that to justify some of their actions hence why some people can be fucking psycho fundamentalist Christians that like don't allow their fucking that don't their, fit the their, ideal of morality yeah, they, or they, good or bad they think rap music is fucking evil or, or they won't let their fucking daughter date fucking colored people you know just cause they think yeah. that Christ, doesn't Christ want is it. white Christ should be like people that like take it to the extreme like that and use religion I just think that people are born unique and that their brain is wired different where you know like there's not really like a theological explanation that you know so based on that um it's just how they're created their serial numbers are different it's it's more of a natural thing than a theological thing um but if, if we're saying that then theology doesn't have the answer to life's problems um that's a good argument if we're saying that it's we're not gaining any type of morality from religion and that we're actually gaining morality through our natural experiences, you know what I mean, and our our interactions with other people yeah. in nature, then it's like, what is the use at the end of the day of holding these religious ideals in such a high regard when it's like we're using our 2022 morality, like I said, to dissect these religious mm-hmm. beliefs. Yeah. So it's kind of like they're beneath us if we're at the point where we could even pick them apart you know what i mean you can't pick apart someone that is above you it's kind of like they're the ones showing you things you know what i mean Mm -hmm. that's that's why water (laughs) yes hydration is Mm -hmm. important uh but speaking about that you said you do have a belief in god you do have a um some sort of belief in theology do you form your belief in god from the bible or where do you form it uh, obviously, every religion shares that there's a there's an idea of, of a god that exists, and so I do share that. I don't think it comes from anything I learned from like fucking high school or anything they try to tell us. The I just indoctrination think, of yeah, high school. exactly. You know, like I just I'm at peace with knowing that something out there created us to be all biologically different, and you know. That's pretty much like how I feel about it generally. And the way that I feel about the idea of God is like it's displaced, meaning like we've defined it the wrong way. Yeah. It's something that does exist, but the definition isn't accurately describing what we're trying to describe. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like God is something that should be explored and not dismissed. That's why I say I'm more theological than more. Most atheists are Satanists because most Satanists and atheists will say there is no God. But I feel like there is one because, like you said, it's talked about throughout religions. But I think the idea of God is what we've gotten wrong and we've defined it the wrong way. We've defined it as some supernatural being that's conscious and it's aware and it's thinking and it's judging you, you know, and it's creating reality on purpose. I feel like if there's a God, it created reality on accident or is just part of the process that it's part of you know what I mean talking about that process I want to talk a little bit about free will because free will is something that's talked about in religion Mm -hmm. and it said that God gave us free will do you feel like we have free will or do you feel like all the decisions we make are just part like reactions to you know actions like Mm -hmm. everything is cause and effect and every choice we make like laws yeah, you know what I mean? Like, we're confined to this thing. It's like we're a ball that just keeps rolling, and we're yeah. in, re- in reality, we're not actually making any decisions. How? What do you think about that idea that there is no free will? Um, that's mainly raised by Sam Harris recently. I actually have a book by his mm-hmm. over here called Free Will, but oh, okay. do you think we have free will, or do you... What does it seem like to you is going on? I believe as human beings, we all have the natural right to live free obviously depends on wherever in the world 
you know, we're born in, you know, like yeah. they have different laws that you have to follow, you know. But I just mean fundamentally, like as humans, do we have choices? Because it's like even if you're in a communist state and you don't have freedom, mm-hmm. um, you still have the choice to like, or do you have the choice to um, overtake the government or rebel against the government? Or do you have the choice to just stay quiet? You know what I mean? Is, I believe there, you have the is there any choice or is it like people are just a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? product of their environment mm-hmm. I believe everyone has a choice it's just people ha- may have other choices that clash with yours and so that's where fucking you know people may not have what other people have you know like to live so the same types of freedom that everybody else has mm-hmm. but as far as choice making like if I said do you want to end the podcast right now? And it's like your mind starts thinking. Mm-hmm. Who Do you make the choice to end the podcast or not end the podcast? Or how does that decision come to you? You know what I mean? Where do thoughts come from? Basically what I'm saying is like what is consciousness? Where does conscious? Where do conscious ideas come from? Mm-hmm. Or, and are we in control of it? Can we actually make decisions? Or is your decision to end the podcast based on other things like what you're feeling currently you know what I mean I feel all that comes from right here in the brain stemming from different parts of whatever emotion like say like if I didn't want to end the podcast I could feel like oh like I enjoy being here I want to keep talking that's how I feel and so the choice came from up there to tell myself hey run the podcast Rather than stop the podcast, so that's actually that's what we're where, going through. Do you think that's right where now? religions get the in psychology? Do you think that's where religions get the idea of like the Holy Spirit from? Because they're like, we don't know where our ideas are coming from. It's just kind of like this guiding arrow yeah, that's I, telling us, oh, this is the next decision you should make or not make. Honestly, what I think is it's just their own way of explanations of how they interpret it. It's like metaphors and analogies or yeah scientific or psychological definitely a lot of wordplay too definitely a lot of wordplay when you read the bible it's a whole lot of stories and it's like these stories are very um analogous like i said a lot of analogies or metaphors where you're you have to put these pieces together or you have to understand language in a certain way to even dissect what you're reading or picking apart you know what i mean bro what if somebody legit like broke the bible in parts and just started rapping about it just started like they put a beat behind the words and they just made it sound like it goes together what do you think that would sound different than you reading it i'm pretty sure they could because it's all like (laughs) poetry has it been done especially psalms there's a lot of religious songs bro there's a lot of religious songs I, i don't know if anybody's like legit trying to Read the the Bible verbatim behind a fucking yeah. sick ass beat. You know? Verbatim, yeah. That'd be a six. The track hour, lists are the chapters long. of the fucking Bible. The... Yeah, I can imagine people trying to do that. So, what do you think? Speaking of um, spirituality and God, what do you think happens when you die? Do you think, like you Man. said earlier before we started the podcast, that you do think there is some sort of reward for um, living a good life and punishment for living a shitty life Uh, but do you think it's the heaven and hell that we've been brought up to believe in or how would you describe it see I don't think heaven and hell is described as like a place with clouds and a gate and a place with fire and fucking lava like I want to I want to believe, see, that's one of life's greatest mysteries you don't know unless you're dead. dead. Yeah. You're going to ask someone that's dead, you know? I mean, that's a different different can of worms, but, um, yeah, like, fucking, man. There's what, no real it, sufficient yeah. answer we could it, give, bro. It, it's, it's one of, like... yeah, 
Based it's on your beliefs currently, what do you think is going to happen to you? Is, is everything going to go dark? Or are I, I want to. Too? I want to believe that the lights just go out, and like you're reunited with the people that you've lost that have obviously died. That they're they've just been waiting for you, and they're they appear to be at the age that they want to be in, and you know, life part two. You know. That's what I want to believe, and hell could be one of like the worst things that you've ever experienced in your life. That you're just living over and over, like fuck. Like you ever watched American Horror Story? Yeah, I've watched yeah, some of it. like you that type think, of shit. Like you you're fucking hell, dissecting the frog, and, like that shit. That you, that's you don't think like, hell is like a metaphor for mind states, the way we talked about minds or metaphors and analogies. That hell isn't so much something that actually happens after you die but it's something that is currently happening to you that depending on the mind state you're in you could be living in heaven or hell mm-hmm. damn that, that's actually interesting to think about because I don't know if you've read um, Dante's Divine Comedy he's the one that Christians get their ideal of hell from um, he's the one that described the circles of hell and the different is sins. That, is that a different book from Dante's Inferno? Or yeah, it's it? Dante's Inferno, oh, but it's okay, called Dante's called... Divine Comedy. Um, but it oh, is okay. Dante's Inferno. I know of that. I know how it describes the circles of hell. Yeah, that's interesting. I always thought that interpretation. But it seems like um, was metaphorical for people. Like when I think of how he said the violent people were like in a pit, gnashing each other and biting each other. It just seems like a metaphor for people that you see in real life, like the yeah. people that are aggressive. Or they categorize and the shitheads that they're going to send after. Yeah, it's a poetic way of describing yeah, people that they, he's seeing in around. In that book, him. they are being judged and they are being sent to where they belong, like the gluttonous people, the envious people, the people who fucking cheat on their. It's like karma. Yeah. They're all doing it karma. to themselves. Karma. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Shout out. But yeah, that's why my interpretation of hell is more like something that's happening now in heaven is something that's, that's happening now it's not something that i feel like is going to happen after i die it's like if you live your life according to the quote unquote law which is nature's law and you fall within the you know flow of nature then you will live in quote unquote heaven but if you try and go against the laws of nature and you try to beat nature somehow or think that you're going to you know rule yeah. nature somehow then you will live in quote unquote hell that's the way that I look at it mm -hmm. but speaking of spiritual experiences I want to talk to you about some fun shit which is psychedelics man what psychedelics have you tried have you had any spiritual experiences on psychedelics that changed and transformed your life I've done acid mushrooms that's it. Just I don't want to disclose it. exactly when I tried them, but what types yeah, of experiences like, did was, you have on that? Did was, you have anything fun. that, like most people describe, transformative, life changing, most important experience of my life type of thing? Did you experience anything like that? Yeah, I did. I actually, like, off the of tabs, I would, like, once I after a little bit after I started peeking, I would I would start kind of feeling myself, and then I kind of start thinking about shit, and I I start like I would question my worth, and then I'd realize it like oh no like okay like like this is what I'm gonna do your and place like, in reality yeah and, like you said your I worth yeah like I try to map out my life I wanna like I I get really ambitious whenever I fucking trip yeah along with the you know, the other shit you see that's colorful and pretty. Speaking of the, like, understanding your life and just the spiritual experience, my first time on psychedelics, I recognized, like, my potential. I'm still going to talk about it, so I don't want to tell the full story yet. I'm going to do a video on it, but I just recognized... Stay tuned. Stay tuned. I'm going to recognize... I recognized my potential, and I recognized that the place that I was at wasn't where I should be. And it just turned me around in a direction that was beneficial. Um, do you remember your first trip? Or even if it wasn't your first trip, what was the most beneficial trip for you? <coughs> and 
why was it beneficial? I want to say it was a time where I took two tabs, and that shit lasted like fucking 14 hours. That was the longest I ever felt like I tripped. I've never tripped like that again. Like, But it was me and my friends, and then one of them was like fucking having like a really, like, he was like past speaking. He was like low-key freaking out. Because he took three. Because um, this homie, he fucking thought he was funny. He tried to one-up me. I'm like, all right, whatever, dude. Take three. And see how you feel. And then he was tripping. And then I started kicking. And then he was, like, freaking out. And I'm, like, trying to help this guy. And I'm, like, dude, I'm fucking. It's tripping too I'm hard. I'm vibing, yeah. dude. I feel like You're everybody's tripping. best friend right now. <laughs> and, like, I like watching fucking rap videos, like, I've, I'll match the fucking song and, the, like, the video to, like, the vibe. Like, dude, I don't know how many times, like, we'd be tripping and then fucking somebody put Lamborghini High by ASAP. Yeah. And yeah you're just watching it and, like, it's just, like, whipping in Lambos, changing colors and shit. And you got Fur, you got Rocky. And it's like, that's a sick-ass video. And then, like, Gorillaz videos and shit. Or just be tripping. And then we'll, like, like going outside, too, just, like, seeing the trees, like, fucking, like, the leaves, like, feels like, like they're fucking, like... Alive, Yeah, like, man. they're you pulsing and shit. You're like, whoa. So yeah. what would you say... Did you learn anything <clears throat> taking psychedelics about yourself? Or... I, I did, yeah. I kind of... What was the biggest lesson? The biggest lesson was the type of people that I, like, I really thought that really cared about me and the type of people that were just using me and I'm kind of like one day I, I was I was really realizing I'm like damn like some of these people are fucking like leeches like, or fucking vultures. whack as fuck that yeah, like straight up and like I should also change a certain thing about myself like you know like I've gr- grown up a lot and then so like I matured and so I kind of like told myself like hey you know like fucking you just gotta fucking get through life and just put the bullshit aside and just do your thing. I was like, okay. like I was literally, I felt like I was like kind of talking self, to myself. Self awareness and self realization. Yeah. And so that. every time I've tripped, I've never, I've never gotten retarded and like freaked out and like tried to call the cops on myself. Like I've, oh, I've always it took it well. It got to the point where like Pretty it wouldn't really hit me. And like I'd have a high tolerance and I'd have to, I'd want to. I feel like if you have good trips like weeks. that, you're self-aware yeah we yeah. me and my wife have had some trip binges where we mm-hmm. we trip so you said that you tried acid and mushrooms which of those was your favorite bro uh acid was cool because it was just quick felt like it hit you quick i just didn't but like it, it because long. it lasts long but dude that shit would still sleep from you like fuck dude i didn't like that you and couldn't go to bed i couldn't go to bed i had to like eat like melatonin gummies yeah. but it was fun, and then it was just a it was a phase I was going through. I haven't done any of that in a while. Um, mushrooms, I've tried mushrooms. It's just mushrooms, like eating them is gross, and like I don't know with them, like mushrooms, like bro, they make me fucking like fart. Not to oh, sound yeah. gross, but dude, they do something to my stomach. I feel you. They do. They it's that reaction in your stomach of the mushrooms breaking down. Yeah, it, it's, it's weird. So you would say that I've done acid, it a few times. It's acid cool. is better than mushrooms from your perspective. Yeah, and I've done it like responsible. Like I don't go out and drive and do any of that shit. Like I'm like I don't want to ever be in that position. Where I'm like fucking freaking out and like and I'm like I'm in a weird spot. So I'm just like whatever, you know, like I'm just chilling. And so I've always thought it was it was cool. I've I've always supported it. I've I think, like, tripping is, like, a type of therapy that people can can do, you know, because I've never done, like, ayahuasca or, like, trip with a bunch of fucking, like, indigenous people or nothing like that. Like, a lot of people can afford to or, take those trips. Yeah, yeah like, in a forest. Like, 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 like Ari Shafir. Yeah. Like, yeah. He has a whole story about him going to fucking Peru, drinking ayahuasca, and, like, having a spiritual journey. Like, that shit's wild to me, dude. But, like, 
you know, that, I, I wouldn't be opposed to that, but I believe that's like a type of therapy because I've listened to, I mean, tap this. Yeah, man, quick. smack that. But speaking of the spirituality and stuff, I want you to ponder on this thought a little bit. Um, do you feel like religious belief is any type of delusion? Do you feel like believing in religion is delusional? Because I personally, my personal belief is that having, holding religious beliefs, believing in things unseen, unproven, is the definition of delusion. But you as a psych major, you do have um, beliefs in a god, some type of god or creator with no proof of it. So what do you feel like? justifies that to the point of it not being um a delusional thought mm -hmm. let's see i want to hope it's not delusion um <laughs> homie's I like i hope i'm not crazy <laughs> <laughs> i hope i'm not crazy but you know that's a good question you know who who really knows that's just what i want to personally believe and like i said i've never really been a religious guy so i don't really ponder too much in it but it's a good question who knows you know? that's the side that I stand on I stand on the side of who knows but that's why I don't align with any um, religious belief or I don't stand on any side of the God equation I stand on the side of I don't know when I meet people that say that they do believe in God I ask them you know like why and if their ideas are convincing, then I'll start believing in God. But I haven't met anyone that says that they believe in God that um, can give reasons for why they believe in God. It's just mm -hmm. kind of like that's what they believe in. And I respect all beliefs, but I feel yeah, like us, I feel like us as a country, we need to um, not even as a country, but just as humanity, we need to form some kind of common truth for what is real and what is not real what is metaphorically true and what is um literally true yeah. you know and that's my um quarrel with religion and religious belief is i feel like it kind of di dilutes people's ideas of what literal and metaphorical truths are and people start thinking that metaphorical truths are literal truths mm -hmm. and they get um, the wrong interpretation of it yeah it's, and i think that that's a problem because like i said i think god is um a metaphorical truth if anything but then that comes down to a deeper question of what is real and you know can we ever define what is real you know because if yeah. you try to tell people God isn't real it's like well what is real because consciousness we accept consciousness is real but you can't see feel describe or even mm -hmm. say where consciousness comes from that like as a psychology major I'm sure you're aware of this that there is no um, explanation for where does consciousness come from in the brain yeah. like there's no chapter like consciousness and it breaks it and calculates it for you this is what fires in your brain and mm -hmm. boom there's consciousness consciousness is this big mystery so it's like defining real and real is kind of shaky that's why it's like i respect all beliefs i can't put down a religious believer because it's like at the end of the day i can't disprove what you believe in there is no disproving it you know there's no disproving consciousness and there's no proving consciousness yep. because we haven't seen that it's there. It's just this word that we've kind of made up to hold the place of this mystery. So that's what God is to me. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I respect religious belief. Yeah. But I just always want to ask people, like, what are the reasons for believing what people believe? Because I feel like we should have reasons for yeah. it. And if they we have assurance, yeah. And if we haven't, th if them. we haven't thought about it much, I feel like it's something that we should think about or spend time thinking. Uh, but aside from that, um, do you think magic, um, like brujeria, things like this, <laughs> do you think that that is real? Yeah. That people could actually put curses and spells on <clears throat> I think one so. another? Yeah? I think so. I think that shit's like... That's, to me, that's unexplainable. What the fuck power creates that for that to exist? You know, I can't... I don't have an answer for that. Have you yeah. ever experienced any magic or brujeria? No, not really. Like, I've just been around paranormal stuff, like shit that's been, like, old or haunted, you know, like cemeteries, like, 
kind of glad I haven't encountered shit like that. Cause that so you're basing your be- your belief on it on testimonies of people or like stories that you've heard of people that have said that these experiences have happened to them. I really looked into it and I really like I used to, I used to be all curious into like the fucking like occult mysteries and shit like that. Yeah. But I don't know like I can't really be solid. I just that's what I think like happens you know like voodoo curses you know like like the fucking diamond that people kept getting and they kept fucking dying how do you explain that bro that diamond was fucking cursed from Egypt well, judging at, that's j- looking at it right from there, a, I think. a psychological perspective you don't think that it's just that the human mind is very suggestive because it's like there's people that could heal themselves from thinking that they're healed you know what I mean are it's like the mind is powerful is basically what I'm saying. Yeah. So you don't think that we could convince ourselves that <coughs> these magical things are having an effect on us when they're not really having an effect on us. And it's more the mind than the object or the magic. <coughs> um, excuse me. See, I like to think that if you're in control of whatever's happening to you and your mind's playing a trick on you, that could be a case. Like you might freak out like, oh, you know, like, Something weird is happening, you know, like how her stoner feels when they first start smoking weed. Like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, like who who's out there? Or like I just think that that's like it could be a psychological feeling that attaches to something that's like you're out of control if it is real, you know? Like But what like is magic? real again? It goes back to yeah, like what is what real? Is like real, what if bro? it's just a subconscious it's just like, what if you're producing this image or this feeling yeah, subconsciously? Yeah, it's just stories, testimonies, you know, like, secondhand experiences, firsthand, whatever, you know, like, you know, like, that shit creeps me out, you know, like, that's why I believe in that type of shit, like, like, different mythical creatures that roam the earth to this day, like, the evidence shown, like, I think that shit's not, not they're not fucking around with that, but, you know, that's just how I believe. If someone doesn't think that, then... You know, that's what they do. I respect it, but whatever. Do you think that, um, because I've, I've practiced with magic, I've practiced with, like, black magic, I've been, like, a practitioner in, um, just different rituals. I have, um, a grimoire of myself, with which is, like, a magic book in which I've written down, like, magic symbols and magic rituals of my own. Um, I look at it as a open-label placebo, which is, like, I'm placebo affecting myself. It's a pill, which like a metaphorical pill, the ritual, and it's not actually magical, but I'm telling myself that it's going to do something for me. Yeah. Transform something about myself. So then it transforms something about myself or my environment. Or it's like you're convincing your subconscious, that way your conscious mind starts to do the work. You know what I mean? What do you think about that idea? Because I, I still currently practice magic in that way, but I don't believe that there's any sort of, like, spirits influencing my magical practice. That's why I ask people who do believe in it why they believe in it, because me as a practicer don't believe in the supernatural. I believe it's psycho- psychological. Mm-hmm. Damn. That's interesting. So you think that... Some people do it because they feel like they're they're just gonna believe it. It's an open label placebo. Like you're open label meaning like you know it's a placebo, but mm-hmm. it's still going to have you're the just effect. Going with it. It's going yeah, you're going with it. It's gonna that. have the effect that it's going to have on you because you're accepting the effects that you've already pre suggested upon yourself. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And that's why magic, in my opinion, only works on suggestible or desperate people because they're always like looking for an answer so it's like if you tell them something happened they're gonna be like something happened you know what i mean that's the way that i look chris angel shit yeah like if i start (laughs) doing some magic right now and i pull out a fucking ouija board and light some black candles homie's gonna be like you know what i mean like already you said oh fuck so it's like if i start doing some shit you're gonna think it's real even (laughs) if i'm mexican so naturally you believe that shit's creepy as fuck yeah (laughs) But that's what I mean. Do you think it's more hypnotism and suggestion coming from a psychological perspective than it is actual magic? Mm. 
Or you've never looked at it that way. I've never really looked at it that way. I just thought it was just something that... Wasn't to be fucked with. Huh? Yeah, it's just like... They're definitely like, you know, like... Meddling with the, the spiritual world that, you know, that they should just leave alone, you know? I don't think it's spiritual. I really don't. And that's because, like I said, I'm I'm practicing in it and I play with it. I think it's more psychological. I think it's more manipulation. And I think the people that do tell you that it's real are trying to manipulate you into thinking they're cool. Because mm -hmm. it's like everyone wants to be special, you know what I mean? Yeah. So they're like, of course they're going to tell you I'm connected to the spirits if you already are scared of them because they look like mm -hmm. some black magic person. But it's like, in reality, people... I could accept that I'm a human and I've lied before to try and make myself look good and been like, oh, I did some shit that never really happened. I went skiing in the fucking Appalachians. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you tell some stories or something that did happen, you'll add some extras on top of it to make it sound super extra. You yeah. Know? So it's like, if I could accept that I do that, I could for sure accept that other people are doing it. You know what I mean? And that's what makes it hard for me to accept any of these ghost stories it makes it hard for me to accept any of these supernatural demon possession stories because it's like people say a lot of shit. Yeah. I say a lot of shit. I haven't seen any shit like that in person. That's wow. what I mean. That's why I asked you, like, <laughs> have you seen or experienced anything yourself? Yeah. Because it's like at the end of the day, if we're only accepting it on testimony, we have to look, who are these people that are telling us this? What kind of background do they have for telling the truth? How much do I know them? How educated are they? Because dumb people say dumb shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like Super dumb shit. You gotta really look at the, the evidence of what you're looking at. And I feel like a lot of this magical stuff, like I said, is more psychological than it is um, spiritual or magical. I think it's people playing tricks on themselves and playing tricks on others in order to gain hierarchical yeah. position over other people and be like, I'm more in tune with the spirit world than you are, you know? Yeah. That's why I'm a non-theistic Satanist. I've said before on the channel, if you haven't seen the videos, watch the videos. What are you doing? I talk about it. I say that I don't believe in, in actual Satan. I use the symbol of Satan. I don't believe in the supernatural. Um, I believe in science, and I believe that science and psychology should hold weight because these are the things that matter and explain ourselves to ourselves, you know? Like I said before, earlier in the podcast, the Bible doesn't explain human psychology to humans. Psychology does. So it's like, what are we even read the, reading the Bible for besides a story? You know, it's the same thing as reading like the Odyssey by Homer. It's like, it'll talk to you about God and it'll talk to you about this person's struggle with God. Um, but is it real? No, like Homer wasn't real. I don't believe Jesus was real. I don't believe there's any historical evidence that a Jesus actually ever walked this earth. There might have been a, like, when you talk about it with people, it comes down to a Jeshua or a Yeshua, which translates to, like, Joshua, which translates to Jesus. Mm -hmm. But it's like, at the end of the day, there was no man who was resurrected. There's no history written about a man who was resurrected or did miracles. And that enough for me is enough to say that this is all just a story that's meant to pass on traditions. That was only written in the Bible, too? Yeah. But I respect people's beliefs. I just feel like we should be, as a whole, humanity focused on what's real, what's scientifically proven. Um, not that science is perfect, but science is the closest thing that we have to facts. You know what I mean? psychology is the closest thing that we have to facts about the human mind there's more evidence than yeah science. it's not like demon possession it's like if you're judging <laughs> mental health on demon possession in the bible you're going to be fucked yeah you know that's... but if you're dissecting it psychologically then you're going to understand why people are acting how they're acting that's why i think that we need to um put the bible in the same category as metaphorical stories and not scientific or life truths that are actually going to break anything factual down for us uh, but speaking of crazy and outlandish ideas what do you think about UFOs and being in the army did you ever hear any rumors about UFOs or unidentified flying objects there's some Navy veterans who have talked about unidentified flying objects have you seen or 
heard any rumors about anything secretive being worked on. So I know there's a lot of mystery between, oh, does, do you, aliens exist? So I used to be stationed on the same site where the government also had a NASA station on my base. Because everybody that went through that gate has to go through background check. Like, normally that's not the case for most military bases because you just show them your civilian ID with whoever's in the car that has to have their military ID and you're good to go through. But this one, it's like, there's a process because there's a sensitive NASA satellite. And so... Sensitive NASA satellite. Yeah, there's, like, you get too close to it, like, a black SUV is going to pull up and some dude with an MP5 is going to tell you to get the fuck down and then you're, they're going to turn you away because you got too close, you know, not confirming or unconfirming that that's ever happened. But, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that that has something to do with what are they hiding that is so sensitive that, like, are they fucking communicating with? otherworldly beings through those satellites that they're so sensitive about, you know? And... It's kind of like when people have such big security, there's something important to protect. Yeah, like, what are you guys fucking hiding, you know? I mean, it could be just something that they don't want people to see, but also, like, I've... Like, I've encountered times, like, I fucking couldn't see that there's a plane and then there's this light that's moving. And it's not, like, it's not a comet. It's not a shooting star. It's just weird shit in that same desert, in Mojave Desert. Notice how aliens somehow love to fucking fly over deserts for some reason. Yeah, me and my wife were just talking about this the other day. Like, it's always deserts weird. or, like, like, the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And I have an app on my phone that literally will show you every single flight that's in the airspace around you. I forgot what it's called. So, sorry, no free advertising here. So, um, and this was actually, like, relatively recent. This was, like, last year. Like, like we were driving, and then, like, I, I rolled down the window because I wanted to see, like, what the fuck is that in the air? And it's just, like, this, like, this weird thing that I thought that was spinning. But it's, like, a light. Like, you think it's, like, a fucking plane, like, flying. Like, it's a weird-ass plane. Like, what is that? Like, and then, like, I checked. And it was like, it wasn't nothing. I don't know if it wasn't like registering with what was in the air, but I'm like, what the fuck? You know? That was the most recent experience. Like, I, I like, I look into other people's like first hand experiences and I determine like if it sounds like they're telling the truth or if they're lying. Depending but, on what you've seen yourself. Yeah. yeah and I'm like, hmm, like, is there, have, has anybody seen anything like that? Weird shit flies in the air at night that fucking flies away. So, do you believe, you said the secrecy, do you believe that it's the U.S. government flying these things? No, no. Or I, do you believe that it's I just it's think aliens? they know something about it, and, but they know shit's weird, too. Like, I don't know if you know, like, on, this, it's an older episode on the Joe Rogan experience where he had a... Shout out, Joe Rogan. J.R.E. <laughs> He had a, a U.S. Navy pilot that was like... That's the one I was, he was like about. He was, he was like an ace pilot, and this was off of the coast of San Diego, and they were doing drills off of an aircraft carrier, and this dude swears he saw this fucking aircraft, literally like, it was like a spinning shape just like float over the ocean, and it just took off like in faster than light speed in like an impossible fucking motion, and... Like, they even recorded it, like, off of, like, their, their jet cam. What the fuck? And so, why would this man have any reason to lie? Like, this guy is, like, a fucking pilot. Like, what the fuck does he care what people think? He's already cool, you know? He's, <laughs> He's already cool. You're a fucking pilot. And you're bro. already on Joe Rogan talking yeah, about, like, bro. flying. That's right? what I think. It's like, what reason does he have to lie? If he wants to write a book, he could write a book about being a pilot. Other, so copies. Yeah, like, it's like, he doesn't need to tell lies and come up with yeah, stories. Yeah, and, like, to... even normal people, too. Like, what the fuck? Show that you know, like I think you think it's so you think it's aliens. You the world is too big for us to think that we're the only motherfuckers living in it. 
To me, yeah. that that's what makes the most sense. I could be wrong. Who knows? We haven't been to fucking Mars yet. Thanks, Elon. <laughs> but, you know, like, I, I think that there's other shit out there. Think about it. We're just literally, like, the smallest atom you can think of in the universe. Yeah. You know, it could be bigger than that. Who knows? So what do you think, to end off, the antidote for human suffering is? What do you think people should do to better their lives during these hard times? Um, During these confusing times when there's so much information from different areas, um, fake news and misinformation and all this different stuff, what do you think people should focus on and put their attention on most to move forward? I say people should stop fucking focusing on all the bullshit that everyone else is trying to feed them. It's part of the fucking, like, the media and everyone else that has their own agenda. And just worry about your family, worry about paying your bills, live a happy life, try to stay healthy, exercise, you know, like, hold your loved ones close to you before they're gone. Don't worry about all that other shit that they're focusing on, you know, like, you have no control as just your own power to control what goes on like out there so just live a happy life focus on what you could do to be happy huh? yeah live a happy life you know be a good person that's pretty much it you know shout out to that man shout out to you for coming through again bro i really appreciate you in the conversation been good we haven't talked in 10 years and this was a good talk so i hope this inspires other people to you know have conversations with people who are close to them if you're not close to somebody and you could talk to them then you could for sure talk to your family if you're not close or if you are close to them so open up have uncomfortable conversations hail to the heathens spreading this blasphemy wherever you are whenever you're watching it however you're watching it hail satan have a good one, everybody. Before we go, would I be able to shout out? Yeah, go for it. Shout out everybody. All right. I'd like to shout out to my wife, my wife, my family, all the homies, fucking Shorty, Jesse, Omar. Hey, Omar. <laughs> Justin. All the real ones from high school. Jamal. I kept in hey, touch shout with out me. to those guys for putting you on to my page so that we could even have this conversation justin jamal omar those guys awesome group of homies we got to get with them sometime to a bunch of dudes and shout out to to the nice guys second platoon those guys you know you got you guys are a good bunch of guys you know hope you're doing good wherever the fuck you're doing and then shout out to mare and Macario, keep it real. Probably the only ones outside of the army I really talk to pretty consistently. So shout out to you guys and all the other homies that I served with. You know, cool. Keep it real. Oh, yeah. Stay up, guys. Stay peaceful. Stay healthy. Stay up. Stay happy. Thanks again for coming.